Yankees are trying to bring things into focus right now. Things seem upside down. They're trying to make things right side up here at the stadium. Yes, it is game day, and the Yankees will try to bounce back from yesterday. Alex Rodriguez didn't want June to end. Jorge Posada wants the losing to end. And today, the Yes Network presents New York Yankees baseball. Today, the Oakland Athletics meet the New York Yankees in the final game of a three-game set from Yankee Stadium in the Bronx. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Yankees baseball. Along with John Flaherty, I'm Michael Kay. Well, the Yankees lost yesterday 7-0. They had one hit in nine innings, and they looked flat. After the game, though, Jorge Posada said something that certainly ignited a bit of a firestorm. He took his teammates to task. Let's listen. I'm not talking about unlucky. Uh, I just think... Uh... You know, luck comes when, you know, when you go after it. And it seems like at times uh, we just go through the motions, and today is one of those cases. Does that make tomorrow extremely important? Well, we forget about it today and, you know, go after it. We got Andy on the mound, and, you know, we look forward to it. It does bring up a red flag, though, when you say going through the motions. Uh, that's the way it is. I think everybody knows what I'm talking about. Very, very strong words from Jorge Posada. What do you think about what he said? You know, it's tough when you're up here and you're watching a pitcher like Chad Godin go through it yesterday. He had good stuff. Jorge Posada obviously was not happy with the effort level in the dugout. And that's only the only way you can find that out is when you're down there going to battle with your teammates. And obviously Jorge Posada didn't like the effort yesterday. He felt like it was time to call some people out or call the team out, and he did it. We will certainly talk more about this during the game. Let's take a look now at the pitching matchup brought to you by New York Lottery. Dan Harron will go Go for the A's nine and two sparkling ERA of 1.91 Andy Pettit for the Yankees four and five with a 3.24 ERA while the Yankees have struggled but hasn't been all negative Alex Rodriguez has had one of the more magical first halves of the season that you will ever see there have been some bad as well some very bad in this season where the Yankees seem like they were just asleep but big moments Alex Rodriguez again that big home run against the Red Sox and then help was on the way in the person of Roger Clemens they might need more help but Again, the bad certainly outweighs the goods for the New York Yankees. We'll take a closer look at the first half of the season when we get back on Yes. That's another beautiful day here in New York City, a Sunday in New York with baseball. What could be better? Well, the Yankee season could be better. Month by month, they were 9-14 and 14 in April, high ERA. In May, 13-15, and 15, ERA went down. ERA went down more in June, and they went to 15 and 11. Yankees have a good home record, but they have not done well on the road. Now, the reason that we pay John Flaherty the big money that we do is he's going to try to make sense of all this. What has gone on with this Yankee season? Why are they so inconsistent? Well, I think when we came into this season in spring training, we said this Yankee lineup is going to have no problem scoring runs, and they just have not been very consistent. You can see by the numbers, the ERA and the pitching staff is getting better. Roger Clemens has come on. He's done a decent job, but the numbers are coming down pitching-wise, but you haven't seen the consistency offensively. Alex Rodriguez having a big year. Jorge Posada, Derek Jeter, the rest of the guys got to start picking up the pace a little bit. Is it there, though? It's there. It's just you need to get hot. You need to get going and just start rolling. A little bit of a different lineup today. We'll give you the lineups, the first pitch, and most of all, and most importantly, baseball, right here on Yes. New York Yankees baseball on Yes is brought to you in part by Dodge. You can take life as it comes, or you can grab life by the horns. Dodge. Continental Airlines, the official airline of the Yankees. And by Audi, truth in engineering. Getting ready for baseball game here at the stadium. Another full house. This will be the 16th sellout of the year here at Yankee Stadium. Yankees trying to win the rubber game of this three-game set against the Oakland Athletics. Andy Pettit taking his warm-ups, and we're taking a look at the A's starting lineup presented by Rico. Shannon Stewart's in left field leading off. He had a great June. Mark Ellis at second base will bat second. The number three hitter in playing right field, Jack Cust. Eric Chavez, the third baseman, will clean up. Batting fifth and playing first base, Dan Johnson. Bobby Crosby, the shortstop, will bat sixth. The number seven hitter, catcher Jason Kendall. Mark Kotze plays center field, he'll bat eighth. And the backup catcher will DH. His name is Kurt Suzuki, he'll bat ninth. And great numbers for Chavez against Andy Pettit. Andy Pettit gets the start for the Yankees. This will be his 19th game. He's 4-5 and five with a 3.24, about a hit per inning, and um, probably a little bit too many walks for him, 56 strikeouts. 
We'll take a look at the Land Rover pitcher scattering report. You just talked about it, Michael. Control issues. He walked five in his last start against Baltimore. See if he can improve on that today. And home run decline. He's given up only one home run per 17.6 innings. And that's down from last year, where it was one home run every 7.9 innings. And he has to figure out Shannon Stewart. He's hitting 431 career off of him. He has to make an adjustment today. IO Digital Cable is the exclusive official HD sponsor for Yankees telecast here on Yes. Well, there's still a buzz around the team about the comments attributed to uh, Jorge Posada. Kim Jones spoke to him on the postgame show yesterday. We played it at the beginning where he questioned uh, some of the desire of some of his teammates, and it's significant because it comes on the heels of earlier this week, Andy Pettit wondering if everybody felt as much emotion and cared as much as he did. Uh, Joe Torre kind of diffused that, and he said he thinks that it was born out of frustration, and he just hoped that uh, if there was a problem where they felt people weren't playing hard, that Jorge Posada would confront the player rather than going to the media. So we're ready for baseball. Let's do it. And there is a strike. We started off, and the count 0-1. 72 degrees here in New York City, another gorgeous day. Shannon Stewart carries a six-game hitting streak into this contest. He hit 373 in June. And he hits one sharply in the hole. Backhanded by Jeter. The jump pass to first. Got him! Vintage Jeter to start off the game. John, that is his signature move. Well, it's a signature move when we saw this play Friday night. Same type of ball into the hole, the big jump step. And what jumps out at you is the arm strength, the accuracy, the backhand and the jump, and then he gets a good grip on it and plenty of arm strength for this throw. Andy Phillips with a nice stretch. Chooses to go with the jump step, which he gets a stronger throw off of. Most infielders would go with that plant on the back leg and come up with a good strong throw, not Derek Jeter right there. And the pitch to Mark Ellis is a strike. The defense has really been stepping up lately. We've seen a bunch of good plays from Derek Robinson Cano turning some double plays. Alex Rodriguez has been solid. And with this pitching staff, not a whole lot of strikeout pitchers on the staff. They're going to have to play defense. And that one is looped into shallow center, and it's a base hit just over the head of Cano. So a single for Mark Ellis. Let's take a look at the entire Yankee defense. You've seen a couple of the guys already. In the outfield, you've got Matsui, Cabrera, and Abreu. That's left to right. Alex Rodriguez has just five errors this season. He had 24 last year. He'll be at third. You've got Jeter at short, Cano at second, and Andy Phillips at first. Posada's behind the plate. Caught all three games of this. Well, he DH'd on Friday. Uh, he was the um, catcher yesterday and today, and Andy Pettit is on the mound. Andy Pettit with a 1.13 first inning ERA, and that's the second lowest in the American League. Chad Godin, who beat the Yankees yesterday, is 1.06 in the first inning. And the pitch to Jack Cust is inside 1-0. Oh. Andy's record at Yankee Stadium is really amazing. 104 and 45. That's a 698 winning percentage. Cuss fouls away. You might say, well, is that a big deal? Well, it is. It's the third highest winning percentage since the expansion era, which began in 1961. Um, only Ron Guidry at 717 and Pedro Martinez at 701 have greater home winning percentages in the expansion era. And it has that great move that'll keep Ellis close. Let's take a look at the umpires today, get you all set up. Ted Barrett's behind the plate. Mark Carlson is at first. Larry Young, the crew chief, is at second. And Angel Hernandez, who umpired at home plate yesterday, he'll be at third today. Your best pitching matchup of this series, Andy Pettit against Dan Heron with the 1.91 ERA. Line drive, base it to right field. Mark Ellis will stop at second. The ball is bobbled by Abreu. And Ellis will go to third, so that'll be a single and an E9.
Not a great start for the New York Yankees. Andy Pettit gets his pitch up to Jack Custon. He likes the ball out over the plate, up a little bit, just able to drive it into right center field. Bobby Abreu comes over. Should be a pretty routine play. The sees bobbles it right here, and Ellis heads up. Goes all the way to third. Actually didn't get much leather on that ball at all right there. Not a good start for the New York Yankees. And you're facing Dan Heron today, who doesn't give up a whole lot of runs. You cannot be giving the Oakland A's any more opportunities than they have. Fourth error for Abreu out in right field this year. Here's Eric Chavez. And the pitch is high. Chris Basak was sent down today, and Edouard Ramirez, a reliever, has joined the Yankees, so another arm in the bullpen. There's a breaking ball strike. Now, Andy Pettit knows he's facing a starter for the A's that has an under two ERA, so you cannot give up that many runs, and he'd love to get one of his signature double play balls right now. And Chavez with good numbers off Andy Pettit, 455. You know, he likes the ball out over the plate. See them trying to go inside right here. And you sometimes you just think about a hitter and a pitcher's strengths, and the, the strengths for Andy Pettit are, you know, sliders away, cutters away to left handed batters, and that's just where Eric Chavez likes the ball. So you can understand why the numbers are so good. Take a look at Dan Heron, starting pitcher. Andy has gotten six double play balls in his last four starts. He'd love one here, but the count now three and one on the A's third baseman. Dan Johnson is on deck. We saw Chavez yesterday take Mike Myers the other way. He's probably going to take that same approach with Andy Pettit today. And the three one. Grounded second base. They go to second one. Not a double play as a run scores. Chavez beat out the return throw. So it's a 4 6 on the put up. Chavez gets his 40th run batted in. The A's have a 1 0 lead. So the error by Bobby Abreu proves costly, but you see the throw here from Robinson Cano. It's just down a little bit, so Derek Jeter isn't going to have that good, clean transfer with the throw. So he pulls Andy Phillips off the bag a little bit. Nice job by Andy Pettit getting the ground ball. Just the exchange not perfect right there for Derek Jeter. Here's Dan Johnson. But first, a throw to first. <laughs> Count one and oh. Johnson 10 for 26 hit one into the upper deck yesterday that was in the sixth inning and it was against Kayagawa it was a hanging slider from Kayagawa that he got up in the zone Dan Johnson was able to drive it out of here that was that one straight back we'll take a look at it Kayagawa made a good pitch 0 and 2 and then he tried to come back with this slider 1 2 and he just spun it up there Dan Johnson hit a deep fly ball in the sixth inning. You know, left on left, he's one of those guys you can you can try and run that fastball in on him or throw that cutter away if you're Andy Pettit and see just keep the ball down. Yankees baseball is broadcast in Spanish. It's available by hitting the SAP button on your television. SAP is brought to you by Toyota, a smart way to keep moving forward. Johnson had stepped out. The umpire did not give him time, and the ball was a ball anyway. See right here, he calls time. Ted Barrett didn't give it to him, so Andy Pettit went ahead with the pitch and actually could have gotten away with an easy strike right there. He just missed on the outside corner. They kind of lost in that game yesterday. Kea Gow actually showed some improvement yesterday. He had a decent ball game. Still has some things to work on. There's a strike, count three and two.
You see a Gow, I thought he showed some better control, some decent sliders, still had some problems mechanically in the third inning. But overall, for a fifth starter, thought he did a pretty decent job yesterday. Runner goes, a 3-2, swung on a miss. Johnson strikes out. So the A's get a run on two hits, one error, and one man left. That run is unearned, an unearned run. A's won, and the New York Yankees coming to bat. Well, the A's have given Dan Harron a run in the top of the first inning. He pitches to a 1.91 ERA, and he'll be pitching this Yankee starting lineup presented by Rico. A little different. Johnny Game in the DH will lead off. The captain in the shortstop, Derek Jeter, bat second. Robinson Cano gets a shot at the number three hole. He'll be at second base, and he'll hit third. Six for 16 against Danny Harron. Cleaning up third baseman Alex Rodriguez. Jorge Posada will catch him bat fifth. Batting sixth and playing left field, Hideki Matsui. Bobby Abreu is in right. He'll hit seventh. The number eight hitter, first baseman Andy Phillips, and Melky Cabrera will play center field, and he's going to bat ninth. And look at the numbers on Harron. 17 starts, 9 and 2, 1.91. Well less than a hit per inning. And the strikeout to walk ratio is outstanding. The Land Rover pitcher scatter report, nine and counting. Dan Heron started off 0 and 2, and he's won nine in a row. And the dynamic duo, he works with Jason Kendall 44 games in a row. And what a deal. He's 37 and 27 with a 3.5 since coming over from the St. Louis Cardinals for Mark Mulder. Well, Johnny Damon digs in. And the pitch outside. The two pitchers on the mound today like pitching under the sun. Danny Harron's ERA in day games is 1.28, which is first in the American League. Andy Pettit, 1.84, which is fifth in the American League. What you're going to see from Heron is a good running fastball. He can he can make that pitch move away to Johnny Damon. He's also got an outstanding split finger, an occasional curveball. 1-1 one, one is fouled away, 1-2. And, and you look at the ERA leaders in the majors not just the American League so two three and four are all in the National League and then Jeremy Guthrie of the Orioles is fifth foul back and there's a lot of reasons for pitchers when they're successful and you're noticing right away here Michael there's a very good rhythm between Jason Kendall and Heron I mean he gets on the mound he sees the sign he's ready to go so he works fast he throws a lot of strikes and he's got great stuff. Yankees have gone scoreless in their last 16 innings. The last time they scored was in the first inning on Friday night. And that's the longest streak here at the stadium since April of 04 when they went 17 innings. Johnny Damon with a fly ball to right field. Jack Cust is there. And there's one away. Let's take a look at the entire athletic defensive schematic. You know that Cust is in right. The center fielder Kotze and Stewart is in left. Cust making his fourth start right this season. In the infield, Chavez, Crosby, Ellis, and Johnson. That's third to first. Kendall starting his third straight game in this series. He's behind the plate. Danny Heron is on the mound. Here's Derek Jeter. Derek has gone hitless in this series. And there's a strike from Heron. Now you talk to some of the people around the Oakland A's, you know, tell me about Dan Heron, and they say, you know what, if you're going to get this guy, you better do it early, because once he finds his rhythm, he's going to be a lot tougher than he is early in the ballgame. It looks like he has it early today. Now, this was a big trade for the A's GM, Billy Bean. Now, the, the A's might have had a bigger lead, if not for that play by Derek Jeter in the first inning. So Derek has not let his uh, mini slump affect him in the field. And what I'm saying about Bean is he knew he couldn't sign Mulder. So if you're going to trade a great pitcher, well, you've got to get something back. And he got back Danny Heron. And since Mulder went to the Cardinals, he's 22 and 15 with a high ERA. And Heron's been the better pitcher. Cheater could not hold up on the pitch low and inside, so he's down on strikes. He's now 0 for 9 in the series. 
One of the reasons he's been the better pitcher is this split-fingered fastball that we just saw to Derek Jeter right there. But the numbers speak for themselves. 37 and 27, an ERA in the mid threes in the American League. That's outstanding in the high ERA for Mark Mulder and the shoulder problem. So, you know, we talked a little bit about in the first two games of the series, Billy Bean and some of the deals that he's made and the turnover that he has on his ball club. This was an outstanding trade for him. There's Robinson Cano as a number three hitter. And Joe Torre is trying to find a three hitter. Matsui's not hitting. Abreu is not hitting. And uh, now he gives Robinson Cano a shot. You almost wonder at some point your best bet for number three hitter might be Jeter, but then you've got to find a number two hitter. Yeah, Derek just fits into that number two hole so nicely, hits the ball the other way, hits behind some runners, but. You know, Joe Torrey's just trying to find that lineup right that right now that he can run out there every day. It just hasn't clicked so far. It seemed to click when they got on that winning streak. You know, Johnny Damon was healthy. He was playing well, and everybody knew where they were hitting in the lineup. Since then, the struggles have started, and there's no consistency. How about this stat, John? If you take out the suspended game when the Yankees scored eight runs, and you have to take it out because those stats don't count yet, the Yankees have scored 23 runs in the last 10 games. And I'm sorry. That's not good enough to win games. That's 2.3 runs a game. And Cano goes down on strike. So if Harron gets better after the first inning, the Yankees might have a long day ahead of them. 17 straight scoreless innings for the Yankees as they go down 1 2 3. We go to the second, 1 0 A's. Hey, let's take a look at the JR Music and Computer World upcoming schedule. Twins come into town for four games tomorrow and Tuesday night at 7. And then Wednesday and Thursday is obviously uh, matinee games. And then the A's come into town for a weekend series. We've got the batting practice show. I said the A's. The A's are in town. The Angels next week. And, and you've got uh, 7 o'clock start on Friday. Then we've got the old-timers game on Saturday and Sunday at 1 o'clock start. That one is blooped into right field over the head of Cano, a base hit for Bobby Crosby. So some seeing-eye base hits against Andy Pettit. Yeah, if you're Andy Petty, you just got to start thinking to yourself, is it going to be one of those days? Ellis had one of these hits where he gets jammed, and Crosby just off the end of the bat just kind of flips it out there over Robinson Cano's head. It's like Andy Pettit has pretty good stuff today, not getting away with much of it right now. Here's Jason Kendall, who was a three for three with a walk yesterday. You know, we mentioned Kay Agawa, and you said that you thought he did a little bit better yesterday. Now, we also mentioned during yesterday's game that he ran for about an hour and a half before the game. And then after the game, he ran for about an hour and a half. So, I mean, if the Yankees ever get a marathon team together, he's going to be the star. <laughs> but my, why so much running? What does that do for him? That's the one thing with pitchers, you know, they obviously they work on their legs and the stamina and stuff like that. He's taking it to another level. It doesn't concern me running afterwards because you got four days to regroup. It concerns me the running beforehand. And this is after the game yesterday, 4.22 p.m. You know, a lot of times you want to run and get the blood moving to get that kind of the, the bad blood out of your shoulder or your elbow and kind of get ready for your next start. Obviously, the effort's there for Kay Agawa. Dribbled slowly, third base side. That is going to be trouble. Pettit field fires, not in time. A base hit for Jason Kendall. Give up a base hit off the end of the bat to Crosby to start the inning, and then you get 0-2 and make a good pitch on Jason Kendall, and it's just a perfect swinging bunt right here. Andy Pettit does a nice job getting off the mound. He's just not going to have enough time, and Jason Kendall, known as one of those catchers who runs well for a catcher, so he gets himself an infield single. Kendall five for seven in the series now has a five game hitting streak. He's had a slow first half. He's looking to pick it up here the last three months of the season. See if he can finish up strong. Here's Mark Kotze. But getting back to Kaya Gawa, you know, whatever works. We talked about it yesterday. If that's his routine and he's comfortable with it, then you do what you, ever, you have to do to be successful out on the mound. Line drive, base hit to right field. Crosby will stop at third as Abreu comes up throwing. And it's cut off by Phillips, and the A's are in good shape. Bases loaded, nobody out. Well, Kotze just jumps on the first pitch right here. Andy Pettit done a nice job with two blue pits and an infield single. This pitch is up and elevated, and Kotze just drives it into right field. 
first bad pitch he's made this inning. Now he finds himself in a bases loaded situation looking for a double play to limit the damage. You know, just finishing up on Agawa, John, it's not working, though. He's not pitching well. I mean, so it's not like something that's working for him. Well, you know what? He goes six plus innings yesterday. He gives up four runs. I mean, it's not a great performance, mm -hmm. but it's a step in the right direction. So, you know, my point is if, if it, you feel good about it, you got to keep doing what you have to do to be successful. Pitch is inside 1 0. I think we have to remember what he is. I mean, he was brought in here to be a fourth or fifth starter. And if you talk about a fifth starter on a club, six plus innings, four runs, you know, you'd probably take it because you think your offense is going to score enough. Just hasn't been happening lately. The 1 0. That one is looped in the right field. The base hit. Crosby will score. Kendall stops at third. Again, the throw is cut off by Phillips. Except for Kotze's hit. Each one has been a blooper, a bleeder. Certainly has not been scalded, and the A's now lead 2 nothing. And Kurt Suzuki, he's a young kid who's their backup catcher. He's a prospect. You see this pitch is up, and he, and he misses location. I mean, Posada's setting up away. It ends up in, but like you said, Michael, not hit very well. Three hits this inning that have not been hit very well for Andy Pettit. Desperately need a double play. Facing a guy like Heron, you can't give up too many more runs to expect to win this ballgame. Well, here's Shannon Stewart, who was robbed of a base hit on a great play by Jeter. The A's have six hits even with that play. And they are jumping on Pettit early to count 0 1. Tough situation for Andy Pettit right here. You face a guy who has good numbers. 431 Shannon Stewart off Andy Pettit. You see the numbers there with the bases loaded. 358 and also a guy who's coming off a great month of June. Popped up. Cano didn't see it. Now coming in is Abreu. And he'll make the play. Not deep enough to try to score. So that's the first out. And that's going to bring up Mark Ellis. Mark Ellis has the only grand slam for the A's all season. He did it on May 18th against San Francisco in an interleague game. We're noticing early in this ball game. Obviously, the Oakland A's have a plan. They're going to the right-handed batters. It looks like every one of them is thinking the other way. They're just going to stay inside the ball, hit the ball the other way, you know, almost neutralize Andy Pettit's cutter. You might have to start going some more change-ups down and away and see if you can get them maybe to roll over. Count one and zero. Oh. Shannon Stewart had a pitch right there that he could have pulled, he could have driven, and you could tell his approach was middle of the field, right field, and popped it up to right field to Bobby Abreu. Bounce straight back here in the count one and one. Andy Pettit has a lot of best friends. They call the double play the pitcher's best friend. And only Kelvi Mesco and teammate Chin Ming Wong have induced more. How about Fausto Carmona? He's in the rotation for the Indians because of an injury, and now they can't get him out. Had a little time as a closer there, right? It didn't work out. I was in the rotation doing well. There's Roger Clemens, tomorrow's starter. He'll start against Booth Bonzer of the Twins. Given out to right field. Again, they take it to right. Tagging is Kendall. Here he comes. Here's the throw. It's up the first baseline. And the runners move up. So a sack fly for Ellis. It's a 3 0 Oakland lead. That was not a good throw by Abreu, as it allowed both runners to move up to second and third, respectively. And it's a strong throw. It's just too high. It's up the line. There's no play at home plate. But like you said, Michael, he missed the cutoff man as well, Andy Phillips, on that play. So he couldn't cut it off and maybe get that third out at second base. And the approach from the Oakland A's, like you said, Michael, everything's middle of the field, right field, trying to stay inside of that cutter and just fight it off the other way. Good situational hitting from Ellis. Now, not to over-dramatize this moment, 
but this is a very big batter in this game. The Yankees have not been scoring runs. They're facing a pitcher with a 1.91 ERA. It's already 3 nothing. A base hit probably makes it 5 nothing, and then you can go into shutdown mode. So there's a big at bat for Jack Cuss. He's already one for one with the single and, and we talked about his approach a little bit in this series. It's out over the plate. He likes the ball. You can tie him up inside. Facing a left handed pitcher here you would assume he's looking for the ball out over the plate like he got his first at bat. Count one and oh. Joe Torrey and Ron Guidry this isn't the way you drew this one up you know obviously yesterday not scoring any runs the one hit you're a little bit flat lose a tough ball game and then you have Jorge Posada make some comments you wanted to come out here and play good baseball early in this game it's just not happening right now count one and one today's close captioning brought to you by your New York New Jersey and Connecticut Lexus dealers. Count two and one. And there's that fastball in. I actually had an opportunity to talk to Jack Cust. His dad was here on the field earlier before the game. Kind of congratulated him on the success of his son. And he said, finally, a team has given him a chance and they're allowing him to be patient. He's a very patient hitter, works in deep counts. The other organizations he was with, they wanted him to be more aggressive. Well, he's in the right place. They preach patience here in Oakland. Just a nice fit and Mike Piazza going down with the bad shoulder you know Cust has got an opportunity and he's taken advantage of it the 13 home runs and a big pitch coming up here for Andy Pettit big pitch for Pettit big pitch for the Yankees a big pitch early in this game runners on second and third two outs Pettit taking too much time so Cust steps out. He's done a nice job Andy Pettit has I mean making Cust aware of that fastball inside so it might be opportunity to stretch the plate out on the outside corner see if you can get him to chase a little bit 2 2 high fly ball deep center field going back Cabrera on the track at the wall see ya a three run home run for Jack Cust and Oakland has jumped out to a six nothing lead. Dan Heron obviously is starting pitcher for the A's he's got to like that right there a six nothing lead in the second inning and we talked about it Andy Pettit did a nice job of throwing some balls inside to Cust to make him aware of it and he just makes a mistake right there Jorge Posada setting up on the outside corner and this one was just right down the middle maybe a little bit middle in and Cust with that power he can hit the ball out to all fields drives this one out just to the right of center. For a big three run homer. We'll take a look at the pitch by pitch right here from Andy Pettit. It's going to be the curveball down in the zone, first pitch. And then he goes with another one for a strike. And here he starts going inside, up and in, just to make him think about it. Then you go back again, you tie him up a little bit. You have him away if you can make a pitch, and he just misses location. 90 mile an hour fastball right down the middle. One oh count on Chavez. And that one is driven to right field and deep. Going back is Abreu on the track at the wall. It's off the wall. And Chavez will be at second with a double. A rough inning for Andy Pettit. It started out with bloops, and now it's moving the blast. And Ron Guidry is going to take a trip out to the mound to talk to Andy Pettit but you said it perfectly Michael you know he made some good pitches early in this in this inning Jason Kendall gets an infield hit and this is just a breaking ball down in the zone it's supposed to be on the outside corner it just ends up down middle and Chavez who has good numbers off of Andy Pettit to begin with just a few feet away from driving one out of here instead he's got a stand up double with two outs. This has to be so frustrating for Pettit. Now you talk about the old guard and he's one of the old guard that has been here for the four championships starting in 96 and he lives and dies with every pitch and he is uh, he's agonizing right now he has not given the Yankees a good performance on a day when they really needed one. 
14th home run for Jack Cust. There's Dan Johnson as the A's have batted around. Count 1 0. Oh. It's a little shocking, too. You know, we've talked about the strengths of this Oakland A's team for the past couple of days. It's starting pitching, their bullpen isn't great, and they don't score a lot of runs. I mean, they're decent at hitting the ball out of the ballpark, I think sixth in the league. But besides that, they're really not known as an offensive powerhouse, and they jump out here for six runs in the first two innings. Ron Malone beginning to throw. And the last thing the Yankees want to do is get seven innings out of the bullpen. Because next week, starting tomorrow, the Yankees have any days off until the All-Star break. So it's seven in a row. Now they do have the extra reliever because they brought up Ed Edward Ramirez. But they certainly don't want to have to go to the bullpen in the second inning. 36 pitches for Andy Pettit. One one. Grounded foul. And the count one and two. And the pitch. That one's driven deep to right field. Going back Abreu. He's on the track. Looking up. See ya. A two-run home run for Dan Johnson. And the A's are pouring it on. They lead 8-0. A nightmare second inning for Andy Pettit. And the thing that jumps out of you out of you is the lack of control from Andy Pettit and especially when he gets ahead in the count one and two tries to go inside with a fastball right here and actually not bad spot it's just up and in it didn't look like it had a whole lot on it and Dan Johnson jumped all over it but it's the one two count where you're trying to make a pitcher's pitch right there and he just catches a little bit of the plate and Dan Johnson was ready for it and that's going to end Andy Pettit's afternoon a very short afternoon for Andy Pettit an inning and two thirds as he jogs off the mound, probably thinking what went wrong. Yankees go to the bullpen. We go to a break. Eight nothing A's. Tomorrow's starting pitchers brought to you by Verizon FiOS. Make the switch to Verizon FiOS TV, internet, phone. Booth Bonzer will go for the Twins. Roger Clemens gives it a try for the Yankees. Coverage begins at six. With our batting practice show, 6.30 is the pregame show. And then right around 7.08 will be first pitch by Roger Clemens. Ron Ballone takes over, and he'll face Bobby Crosby. And the pitch is outside 1-0. and 12th game for Ballone, less than a hit per inning. Obviously, he wants to get the walks down. And the Yankees are looking to get two or three innings out of him. Remember, he pitched two innings yesterday. Rounder to short. Jeter's there. And that will finally do it here in the second. But the Yankees give up seven runs. Andy Pettit in particular gives up seven runs. The big blast, obviously, the two home runs. One by Jack Cuss, one by Dan Johnson. It's 8 0 open. We go to the bottom of the second. Well, this year, when you're out of town and out of the Yankees broadcast area, you can still watch Yankees baseball log on the MLB.tv, and you can watch the game on your computer via the Internet live. For more details, visit www.yankees.com, where baseball is always on. Blackout restrictions apply. Well, Dan Heron has to feel pretty good about life right now. We go to the bottom of the second inning. He has an 8-0 lead. Alex Rodriguez will lead off. And the pitch is low. 1 0. Let's see if the Yankees can battle back. Joe Torrey always preaches little bits. Try to take little bites. Don't try to get all eight at a time and just chip away. It's early enough that you can, but it's a very, very good pitcher on the mound. 2 0. Yeah, you have eight, eight innings of offensive baseball left. You have to start, to, like you said, just chipping away. Don't try and think too big. If you work some walks, take a couple of base hits and see if you can maybe get one big swing to get you back in it. Well, for Heron, it's not going to be an easy thing to do. And Heron's going to 3-0 on A-Rod. And you almost hope from the Yankee perspective that a guy like Heron, you know, he pitches maybe a little bit differently where he relaxes a little bit, you know, has a big lead and maybe lets up. Not where he's letting you hit the ball, but the focus isn't there that it would be in a one-run ball game. 
And there's a strike to A Rod. So he went up there looking to take a strike and he did. Now the count three and one. And A Rod walks. Yankees first base runner of the day. See Heron not happy with himself. You know, obviously spent a lot of time in the dugout when the A's were out there scoring seven runs in the second inning. Gives Alex Rodriguez a leadoff walk, and we talked about it before. Usually when he has trouble, it's early in the ball game. The first inning looked outstanding. Yankees hoping to do a little bit of work here in the second. And there's a strike to Posada. Well, Posada made the big news after the game yesterday when he questioned uh, the effort of some of his teammates. And then when Kim Jones followed up and said, you know, who are these players? And he said, everybody knows who they are. Well, the people in the media don't know. Who they are, maybe the people in the dugout do. There's a base hit for Posada as A Rod moves to second. And we discussed this in the open, John. Now, Jorge Posada and Andy Pettit earlier this week kind of make these generalizations about people not caring, people not trying, and they're not naming names. We'll take a look at what Posada did with that pitch that stayed out on the plate. I think that's a little dangerous in itself, John because you're painting everybody with the same broad brushstroke and now you start guessing games amongst fans and media who's the guys not trying well you, you do it's a little dangerous but you know we don't know what's going on behind closed doors you know there might have been some discussions between teammates Deki Matsui swings over that curveball you know there have been team meetings where I'm sure some things were addressed between between the guys on the ball club we just don't know what's going on in that clubhouse but Jorge Posada obviously frustrated with yesterday's effort you know only the one hit but you know when you're on that dugout you can sense the intensity level the energy level the effort level and Posada not happy with it yesterday so he decided to take it public with uh, with the media. Now Joe Torrey was very calm talking about it before the game in the uh, in the dugout to the media but he did say why not say it to your teammates rather than going to the media so if they had said it to their teammates and they felt that there wasn't a response maybe there was a method to Jorge's madness by putting it in the, uh, the papers and on the TV and the radio in the hopes that maybe you embarrass your teammates into performing better. But I think that there might be something to that but you know I, I remember back in Toronto there was a big team meeting some things were addressed between some of the guys on that ball club and you know what there, there hasn't been much of an improvement there was a hot streak there for a while and now another losing streak a tough stretch here on the road trip and now this homestand not starting off the way the Yankees wanted it and you know you bang your head up against the wall trying to figure out a way to get this ball club to play better and to respond and Jorge decided to take it public yesterday. Well Yankees trying to uh, chip away right here in the bottom of the second there behind an eight nothing deficit and there's first and second nobody out the 2 2 to Matsui tries to pull an outside pitch and grounds it to first they go to get the force at second and they get just that now Joe Torre as we mentioned spoke for a long period of time in the dugout and here's some of what he said about keeping it in house you know we have family issues here when I'm, when I'm talking about family I'm talking about teammates and if that's an issue I mean if we ha if we have family issues then you should address them the way you would at home you know you, you don't talk to the next door neighbor about you know what's going on with your with your wife or children or hey went to the next door neighbor Kim Jones is the next door neighbor mm, yeah that's right he told her You know, it's just frustration like you said Michael I mean knowing Jorge and the way he plays the game I mean even when he talks about contract issues he said all I want to do is win and when it's not happening day in and day out he probably just had enough and felt like something needed to be said and again you could almost explain it away as one man's frustration but it came on the heels of what Pettit said earlier in the week and these are two of the cornerstones of what this team has done since 96 and they're the ones who spoke up. 
pitches low to Abreu the count one and one that's what makes you sit up and take notice a bit if they're going to talk if both of them are going to see the same things there's got to be something there Joe Torre doesn't see lack of effort though he does not see that although I doubt that Joe Torre would come out and admit it to the media that this guy's not trying I'm sure if he sees it he's probably dealing with it internally one one there's a strike and count one and two and my thought goes back to the 05 season when I, when I was a member of this ball club and, and we were really not producing well early in the year and there was almost the feeling like you would just go out there and it would happen you know instead of making it happen forcing it to happen and, and you know kind of Georgie said yesterday about not getting any breaks or not getting any luck things like that you create your own luck I think that was his point yesterday soft roller and Harren will tag out a brave Alex Rodriguez scores so an RBI for Abreu and that's significant because it's the Yankees first run in 17 innings and the A's lead is now eight to one. This is what the Yankees are going to have to deal with all afternoon with Heron. You know he's got a great split finger fastball. If he gets ahead in the count it's his primary strikeout pitch and Bobby Abreu just able to get a piece of it to drive in a run. Try and chip away and. Hope that some of your guys down in the bottom of the order like Andy Phillips can come out with a big two out hit. Runner at second base now. And the count one and oh. I just think that when when you hear words like that John you, you haven't been an athlete there's nothing more damning than somebody saying either you choke or you're not trying I mean athletes just can't deal with being called chokers or, or they're not trying and you know two big marquee players in Major League Baseball have hinted that players aren't trying I mean that's really really unbelievable to accuse teammates of not trying and uh, it's something that has to be addressed and you're right maybe it is being addressed in the clubhouse. Yeah and it's one thing that you know it's dangerous because you got to remember there are different personalities on every ball club and, and you got to pay attention when a guy is going good how he handles himself you know how does the energy level look and when he's going bad does he carry himself the same way you know what is it different is it better is there more energy you know it's a, it's a tough situation I think sometimes when guys are struggling and you're not hitting it looks worse than it actually is the body language isn't there. You know and it's nothing that a few hits and a few wins can kind of get you moving in the right direction. That's a great point John because Joe Torre said let's look at Bobby Abreu. Bobby Abreu carried us last year and he acted the same way then when he was hitting over 300 as he's acting now hitting over 250. He said so was he trying last year and not trying now. And I thought that that was a good point because when someone's not producing they might be looking the same way as they did when they were producing but you're looking at them through a more jaundiced eye. I totally agree you know the, the name that jumps out to me Robinson Cano who makes the game look so easy sometimes you know and last year he's hitting 340 and he carries himself the same way this year he's not hitting quite up to what he did last year but he plays the game the same well the same way there's a smoothness to his game. There's a base hit to left center field by Andy Phillips Matsui will score Phillips with an RBI single and Oakland now leads eight to two Yankees showing some life here in the bottom of the second. Showing some life and maybe a little bit of fight and that's what it's going to take to get back in this ball game are the two out hits. Andy Phillips gets a curveball down in the zone. It's a three two curveball for a strike. Does a nice job of just staying on it not trying to do too much and drive it right back up the middle. But it's going to take some walks. It's going to take some two out hits to get back in this ball game. And then you hope later on you might get one big swing that'll take you over the top. Here's Melky Cabrera batting in the number nine hole. Runner at first base, Andy Phillips, with his third ribby of the year. And the pitch to Cabrera is a strike. It's got to feel good for Andy Phillips. You know, he spent some time in Scranton, then comes up here, thought he was going to get some playing time, and then missed about a week where he just sat on the bench and was an extra player. Now getting an opportunity again to show what he can do. Hit sharply. Oh, what a play by Chavez. Took away an extra base hit. And that's why he's won six straight gold gloves. Plays like that, that was outstanding. 
But the Yankees chip back. They score two runs on two hits, no errors, and one man left on base. We played two at the stadium, an eventful two, 8-2 Oakland. We go to the third inning. Jason Kendall leads off against Ron Ballone. It's 8-2 Oakland. Andy Pettit has been knocked out of the game, an inning and two-thirds. Now, that's the most earned runs that Andy has allowed since he was with the Astros last year, April 4th, 2006. He gave up 10 runs, seven of them earned against the Marlins. Now, how many innings was that? We'll check that out because I don't think it was an inning and two-thirds. High fly ball, left center field. Melky Cabrera is there, and there's one away. Well, it'll be interesting to hear from Andy after the ball game, you know, how he felt. Obviously, he didn't have a great performance, but, you know, it looked like he had pretty good stuff early on, gave up some cheap hits, and then the next thing you know, the location left, and then the home runs followed. Here's Kotze. He had a single off Andy in the second inning. And now he has a single off Ballone here in the third. Mark Kotze going up there hacking. First pitch off Andy Pettit. He had a base hit. First pitch off of Ron Ballone right here. Just drives it right back up the middle. Left on left. You don't give those lefties an opportunity to come with their breaking ball. First fastball you see, you put in play. He's two for two. Now that game that we were talking about, Andy allowed 10 runs, seven of them earned. That was last April. Uh, for the Astros, he went four and two-thirds. He allowed 13 hits, and three of the hits were home runs. Here's Kurt Suzuki. He had an RBI single right field in the second inning. And the pitch is inside. 1-0. The A's kind of think life would be better long-term with Suzuki down in the minor leagues playing every day. That's why they're trying to get Mike Piazza into catching shape. And Piazza then would back up Kendall. Suzuki would go down to AAA and play every day and be the catcher of the future. A lot of teams think that if you keep a youngster on the bench, you're retarding his overall progress. The A's thought that Suzuki would play a bit more, but uh, that hasn't been the case, so they want to get him more bats down in the minors. And Jason Kendall, a workhorse, I mean, he catches about 140 games plus every year. And you know, it's interesting with Suzuki's. He has a reputation as a catch and throw guy, but he comes up to the major leagues in limited duties, hit 429 with two home runs. We talked to some of the people around with the Oakland A's. They say, you know, he, he had a reputation as a good receiver, good thrower, and his catching has kind of gone backwards a little bit. He needs to go back down to the minor leagues, maybe tighten that up a little bit, and like you said, possibly be the catcher of the future here. You think your catching skills erode if you don't catch? Oh, there's no doubt you get out of a rhythm. It's just like anything else hitting when you're not playing. You're going to lose your timing catching is the same way. Got to think about your mechanics more than just going out there reacting and playing. Bob Guerin spent a lot of his career as a backup catcher. Friday we showed a little highlight reel of Garen with the Yankees hitting a couple of home runs making a nice throw and I told Bob about that he goes wow that would be great to see he said my kids don't think I played <laughs> and so we uh, burned a CD of this a DVD and uh, now he's going to show his kids that he actually did have a couple of home runs with the Yankees. <laughs> Grounded foul outside of third. So I gave him the uh, the DVD today and he was all pumped. He said, oh, wait till they see this. Bob known as a good catch and throw guy, solid receiver, worked well with the pitching staff, and he was a big dude. He was probably like a Sal Fasano, you know, runs into a few, a couple of home runs, but known more for his defense and doing a nice job with the Oakland A's here. 
swing and a miss and Suzuki chases a fastball up and away for the second out. Well, Ron Ballone's job is to keep the Yankees right where it is right now to do some solid middle relief and a good fastball from Ron Ballone 88 miles an hour just elevated a little bit on the outside corner of the plate looks like Suzuki was trying to pull that ball. Here's Shannon Stewart. We take a look at Shannon Stewart. Stewart in our scouting report. He had a red hot month in June. 373 was an outstanding month for him. And best case scenario coming in here, he was a red hot hitter and he had great numbers off of Andy Pettit. And he's free to go. He signed a one year deal with the Oakland A's for $1 million. So a nice bargain for Billy Bean in the Oakland days this year. Seems like Bean always finds those kind of bargains. You know, Shannon coming, he was hurt last year. You know, didn't have a whole lot of offers. He comes in here for a million dollars, and you can see the numbers, almost 300, seven home runs. Not the best outfielder in the world, but a quality hitter. Yeah, you know, you look at a guy like this, too, come the trade deadline. You know, if Oakland is not in it, will they make a move for him? He can go to a contender. High fly ball deep left center going back Cabrera in Death Valley. He makes the play on the warning track for the final out of the third. No runs a hit, no errors, and one man left on base. We go to the bottom of the third inning here at Yankee Stadium in the Bronx. The Oakland Athletics eight, the New York Yankees two right here on Yes. Samsung's Four Seasons of Hope and Joe Toy have teamed up to make a difference in the community. For every Yankees home run hit at home this year, Samsung will donate $1,000 to Joe Torre's Safe at Home Foundation to help end the cycle of domestic violence. You can join the team and support Samsung's Home Run for Kids by visiting fourseasonsofhope.com or joetorre.org because a little hope can make a big difference. Johnny Damon takes a pitch outside 1-0 as we are underway here in the bottom of the third. 8-2 A's. It'll be Damon Jeter and Cano top of the order against Danny Heron and their strike. Is it hard for a pitcher when he has a big lead to not pitch differently. I think the best that the Yankees have ever had a pitcher who dealt with a lead well was David Wells. He just who strikes well, David Wells pits the same way no matter what the ball game was it was a strike with every pitch that he threw which made the catcher's job that much easier but uh, you know I always had trouble calling a game when you had a big lead like this because you almost you get I don't know if the right word is defensive but you just want to throw strikes instead of attacking a hitter you know you're just like oh let's just get strike one and then we'll go from there instead of having a, a big game plan on how you want to get a lineup out that one's driven to right field and deep backing up cost he can't make the play one hop up against the wall as Damon goes into second. You can see just from that fly ball that Cust is probably a very good DH. Yeah the outfield is definitely not his strength and especially playing right field you know you think he might be more suited towards left field or maybe a first baseman but swinging the bat is his strength. But it's a split finger fastball from Heron that he just leaves up in the zone. Johnny Damon gets a leadoff double here in the third inning and the Yankees just trying to scratch and claw and get their way back in this ball game. Take a look at how Johnny gets out of the box. Looks like he's running better right there. Easy stand up double for him. I'm sorry a sliding double. The slide was for show John. It was it was. He could have been in there standing up. He just Easily. wanted to make me correct myself. Here's Derek Jeter. He struck out in the first. And the pitch inside. Derek is 0 for 9 in this series. He's had at least one hit in every series he's played this year. And he has not had one yet. Good time for one as the Yankees can cut the lead down to five. There's a strike. The Yankees just keep the pressure on right here. You know, every inning just kind of get some men on base and see if you can make Heron just work hard every inning. Don't give him any easy one two three innings and we talked about it the first two games Michael the bullpen for this Oakland A team is not their strength. Just make Heron work and see if you can get into that bullpen late in the ballgame. 
Another strike. He throws strikes on the corners at the knees. Jeter not enamored with that call. See, it's a fastball. It's going to be down in the zone, maybe knee high. That was a pretty decent pitch, but he gives you a lot of different looks. You know, a big curve ball. He's got some fastball with some movements and a great split finger that he usually tries to put people away with. Aaron looking to go 10 and 2. Also looking to better his credentials for possibly starting the All-Star game. Right now, CC Sabathia looks like he's in pretty good shape. Josh Beckett. Josh Beckett and Sabathia. And Jeter down on strikes. He foul tipped the ball, but Kendall held on. And wow, to see Derek Jeter 0 for 10, very, very rare. That's what's happened in this series. Take a look right there. It looks like that split finger fastball. And he threw a fastball that was about 93 miles an hour of the pitch before that Derek fouled off. And it just speeds your bat up a little bit. Then you get this nasty split down. A lot to handle right there. We talk about the All Star game, Michael. I mean, that game is going to be at AT&T Park in San Francisco. It'd be a nice, I guess, local story for a guy from Oakland starting that ball game for the American League. There's a ground ball by Kenota Johnson. And there's two away. And that'll bring up A-Rod. The All-Star lineup will be announced later today. And then there's a number of ways that you can get on with the manager and the players voting and internet voting, but the, uh, the initial lineups will be announced today. Just from the fan voting. And Alex Rodriguez at last count had the most votes of anybody. And he has earned it this year at 330, 28 homers and 79 runs batted in. He walked and scored in the second. And a strike from Heron. Andy Phillips picked up a two out RBI last inning. Alex Rodriguez trying to do the same thing. He's kind of chip away at this lead, and the way you do that was some big two out hits. And the count one and one. This isn't a bat right here. I think last year Alex Rodriguez would be thinking, you know what, they're probably going to pitch around me, pitch carefully to me, you know, to get to Jorge Posada behind me. This year he doesn't seem like he's thinking as much at the plate. He's kind of seeing the ball and hitting it, and the numbers speak for themselves. July is not a month that Alex was looking forward to because June was so good. Best numbers for a Yankee player since Mickey Mantle in May of 56 when he ended up winning the Triple Crown. There's a strike. The 2 2 pitch. He struck him out. Harum gets tough, strikes out Jeter, strikes out A-Rod, and the leadoff double by Damon is wasted. No runs are hit, no errors, and one man left. We go to the fourth. It's 8-2 A's. Affleck. Hey, it's time for the Aflac trivia question here in the top of the fourth inning. Dan Harron has won his last nine decisions. Who was the last A's pitcher to have a 10-game win streak prior to the All-Star break? We'll find that out in the bottom of the fourth inning. Mark Ellis leads off against Ron Malone, and the pitch is a strike. 8 10 and 0 A's, 2 3 and 1 Yankees. If you joined us late, Andy Pettit was knocked out in the second inning, two outs into the second inning, and he gave up all eight runs. Nubbed in front of the plate, Posada right there, and there's one away. Good job by Ron Ballone. You know, middle relief right here. Your job is just to throw up some zeros and keep your ball club in the ball game. So far, so good for Ron. Right 
Here's Jack Cust. He had the big blow in that second inning. Turned a 3-0 lead into a 6-0 lead and really started the downfall of Pettit. Then Chavez doubled. Dan Johnson homeward, and that was it for Andy as they took him out of the game. And the pitch upstairs to Cust 1-0. And Cust with those 200 home runs in the minor leagues, you know, finally gets an opportunity to play every day at the major league level and 14 home runs, 37 RBIs. One of those feel good stories about this year. How about this for a strange bit of news, John? The Seattle Times is reporting that Mike Hargrove will announce his resignation today, which is odd. They had just won seven in a row. They're in the wild card hunt. Instead, in fact, they're only four games behind the Angels. They're 44 and 33. Wow. So they don't give a reason, but that is what's being reported by the Seattle Times. That's that's a pretty good job to do. Pitches up and in as Cust goes down. See Jorge Posada setting up away, and it's an off-speed pitch, 80, 80 miles an hour, by a little slider that just backed up a little bit. Cust was able to get out of the way, but getting back to Hargrove, you know, the first thing you start thinking about, you don't want to speculate, but you hope every, everything with his family right. is okay. Obviously, he has that club playing good baseball. Much better baseball than people thought, and they're playing good baseball without Richie Sexton hitting. Cust with a high fly ball to right center. You can see after being knocked down, he wanted to knock that ball out of the park. Instead, he flies out the Cabrera two-way. And this is where Seattle stands in the wild card stand. It's just a game back of the Tigers. And the Twins four back, the Athletics five and a half back, Blue Jays seven and a half, and the Yankees are eight. Now, coming into the season, Hargrove and Ichiro did not have the best relationship. And uh, Ichiro is going to be a free agent at the end of the year, and you wonder if that plays into it. Again, you don't want to, uh, you know, speculate what's going on. You hope that health issues are not involved, but uh, that's what's being reported now that he's resigning today. There will be people lining up to take that job. It's a beautiful city. It's a great ballpark. It's an ownership that's willing to spend money. It's a nice situation. And they have some good young players on that ball club. So you don't you don't see it as a one year thing. You feel like they probably have a nice future there in Seattle with those young players. Chavez hits one deep to center. Melky Cabrera on his horse. He's there. And he'll put it away for the final out of a one two three inning. Ron Malone's done a nice job. Two and a third shutout innings in relief. We go to the bottom of the fourth. It's eight two A's. We go to the bottom of the fourth inning. Let's take a look at the answer to the Aflac trivia question. Danny Harron's won nine in a row. Who was the last ace pitcher to have a 10 game win streak prior to the All Star break? And the answer is Mark Mulder. How about that? All comes together. He was traded from Mulder, and now he might have a 10 game win streak before the All Star break, just as Mulder did in 04. It's incredible how those things come together. Amazing. Here's Posada. Pitches outside. This is a. Um, a release from the team from Hargrove a quote from him I cannot continue to do this job if my passion has begun to fade. The 1 0. Are you reading between the lines. I don't know what to make of it. You know what I. I can kind of relate. I mean, obviously, managing and playing are different things, but that was really the reason that I chose to hang up the spikes and retire because you didn't want to do the work anymore. But you would think, with a you know a ball club playing as well as his team is playing, sounds like a lot of fun out there. Obviously, not for Mike Hargrove. Well, Hargrove's had a nice run. He was uh, Indians manager, Orioles manager, and Mariners manager. Took the Indians to within one inning of winning a championship against the Marlins, but uh, Jose Mesa couldn't close it out. I'm sure more will come out on this story as the uh, the days unfold. The three-one and Posada walks. 
Aaron is not handling prosperity very well. No, you can see he's not happy with himself too. You know, and it, it, the thing you notice from the left-handed batters, he's losing pitches that are that are off the plate away. See, Jason Kendall's going to go out and have a little conversation with him and see if he can get him back on track. But there are just some guys who pitch better in tight ball games. You give them a big lead right here, a six-run lead, and your only thought is to throw strikes. Not that easy to do sometimes. Well, you know what? He keeps pitching like this, John. He'll have himself a tight ball game. That's just what the Yankees are hoping. You know, the, the formula for getting back in this ball game is good middle relief, which Ron Ballone is supplying so far, and some opportunities offensively where you get some base runners on base, see if you can chip away. You play for that one big swing later on in the ball game. And the pitch to Matsui is a strike. Matsui grounded out to first. A fielder's choice force at second. And he is four for his last 34. And the count one and one. Field line. It is a base hit and then bounces into the seats for a double. Yankees are set up to chip away a bit more. Second and third, and nobody out. It looked like the curveball from Heron, and it is. And Jason Kendall setting up away, but it just falls down and in. And it kind of plays right into a Deki Matsui swing right now as he's kind of pulling off a little bit anyway. But he's just able to hook this ball down the right field line and keep it fair. And then you're going to see it bounces into the seats here for a ground roll double. But, you know, really the only place that Matsui can do anything now with his mechanics falling off is down and in. So it kind of played right into his, his weakness almost, so to speak. Here's Bobby Abreu. He drove in a run with a slow roller up the first baseline fielded by Aaron. They'll give up another run with the infield bat. Count 1-0. Oh. Th this at bat has a lot of implications. Obviously a base hit would probably make it 8-4, get the Yankees back in the mindset that they could win the game, and also would be really a weight off the shoulders of Bobby Abreu, who needs to get a big hit. His average down to 248, and the count 2-0. Bobby is 2 for his last 24, and 4 for his last 34. Jorge Posada leading without his helmet. High fly ball to left. Stewart does not have a great arm. He'll make the catch. Tagging is Posada. Also tagging is Matsui. It's a sack fly for Abreu. And the Yankees have cut it to 8-3. Good base running by Matsui. Well, it's good baseball all the way around. Bobby Abreu comes up there in a situation where you got to do some situational hitting. And you see Jorge Posada tags up and then puts his helmet back on. He's going to score easily with the, with the weak arm of Shannon Stewart. But nice base running by Hideki Matsui. Knowing who's in left field, knowing he was drifting back towards the wall, he goes back to tag and it's going to make it to third base easily. Nice hitting, nice situational hitting, nice base running by Matsui. I'm not quite sure what Jorge Posada was doing with his helmet. I don't get it. Infield remains back. Here's Andy Phillips. Now, I, under, I kind of understand what Garen's doing. He doesn't want a ground ball to squeak through the infield and then keep the rally alive, but I, I've never been a big fan of just giving up runs. Now, second and third, I understand, but with a runner at third, I don't understand why you wouldn't bring the infield in here. I think he's just playing for outs right now. He just gave up a run. It's an infield single for Phillips and RBI as Matsui scores. Yankees are right back in it. It's 8-4. And it's an infield single. It would have been a clean base hit, you would think, if Crosby was playing in right here. Ball's hooked in the hole. And good things for Andy Phillips now starting to happen. He gets a two-out RBI, his first at bat. Now gets an infield single with another RBI. Things starting to come together for him, getting a little playing time, getting some consistent at-bats. 
This car brought a telecast is presented by authority of the New York Yankees and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. And the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without the express written consent of the aforementioned New York Yankees. Along with John Flaherty, I'm Michael Kay, and you're watching Yankees baseball right here on the Yes Network. Looked like a blowout after an inning and a half. It was 8 0 A's, but the Yankees, with two in the second, now two in the fourth, have made it a ball game. It is 8 4. Runner on first, still just one out. Here's Melky Cabrera. Kurt Young visited Dan Heron at the mound. And the count now 1 0. And you don't want to get too far ahead of yourself, but you start thinking, you know, what a great win this would be for the New York Yankees. You know, you're, you're probably number two guy in your rotation behind Chin Ming Wong. Andy Pettit has a tough afternoon. They could find a way offensively to pick him up and, and pull out a win. It would be a huge day for the Yankees. Still a lot of work to be done. He's thrown 70 pitches so far, so a lot of pitches for him. And as we've told you throughout the weekend, you want to get into the open bullpen. That is not a strength with all the injuries out there. The 1 1. 2 and 1. And it's gotten to the point for Bob Guerin that, you know, he's just going to go with his starters as long as he can. He's going to kind of push the envelope with the pitch count and try and stay away from their weakness and middle relief. You know, they feel pretty good about Alan Embry, who's now their closer, and Casilla, who's their setup guy. He's really trying to stay away from the rest of his bullpen, and that means stretching out his starters just a little bit more. Two two count on Cabrera. Round inside first fair and down the right field line. Phillips will go to third. Going to second is Cabrera. The Yankees second and third with one out. Well, you got to admire the fight in this Yankee ball club today facing one of the toughest pitchers in the American League. Melky gets that split finger fastball down and in and just drops the bat head on it. He's able to keep it fair just inside of first base and Dan Johnson. See, Melky's going to get there easy with Jack Kustoff out in right field, not known as a great defender. The Yankees all of a sudden cut the deficit in half and now looking to add on right here. Infield again back. A ground ball makes it 8 5. Aaron deals, and he deals a strike. Four runs allowed today, the most since April 2nd, which was opening day. And the count quickly 0-2. Damon doubled his last time up right over the head of Jack Cust in right field. So 8 nothing is turned into 8-4 with the possibility of 8-6 on a single. It has been a rough road trip for the Oakland Athletics. They lost three in a row to the Mets, three out of four to the Indians, and they split the first two against the Yanks. Check swing fouled away. Bob Guerin with his college of coaches there trying to get through this one. Kurt Young and Bob Schaefer. The 0 2. Foul boy. Well, if you are sticking with us through 8 0, and you have friends who probably just you know, switch the channel, call them and say, hey, it's getting interesting. Go back to yes. One and two. No, 
up foul. The A's have all the faith in Heron because there's nobody up in the bullpen. Well, it's one of those things, if you're Bob Guerin, I mean, you, you're going to go with your number one guy as long as you can. I mean, the Oakland A bullpen, not their strength. You see them just taking it easy out there. But basically, you're going you're gonna to use Heron as long as you can. You get that pitch count up maybe 110, 115, 120, and then his day will be done. And the Yankees have done a nice job getting that pitch count up here in the fourth inning. The one, two. He struck him out. That's a big strikeout of Damon. And now that passes the baton to Jeter, who has been struggling. They threw a couple of good split finger fastballs that Johnny Damon was able to foul off. This one just dives down in the dirt. Nice play by Kendall. Nice block. And he applies the tag to Johnny Damon. And you said Derek Jeter has not been swinging the bat well. It's one of those situations you expect the captain to come up with a big two out hit right here. Jeter has struck out twice today. He's 0 for 10 in this series. Remember, he got that big hit in the eighth inning against the Orioles, and uh, since then, he has struggled in this set. There's a strike. Boy, it's so weird, John, how you called it on Friday night when Jeter tried to bunt the first inning. You said, well, maybe he doesn't feel good about his swing. And I don't know if that became a self-fulfilling prophecy, but his swing has not been right. No, and I, you know, playing with Derek for the three years that I did, there would be times when he just wasn't feeling it. He would drop down a sacrifice bunt, a bunting for a base hit. And he gets hit by Harris. And Steve Donahue, the assistant trainer, and Joe Torrey quickly out of the dugout. He got hit hard. And we'll take a look and see where this one got him. But, you know, we've noticed from Heron that the balls have been up and away to the left-handers. This one runs in, and it's off his elbow, which I guess is good news if you're, you're the New York Yankees. You usually take so many of those hits off of his hand. This gets him right on the back of the elbow. Which doesn't feel very good, but I think you're, you're probably a lot better than taking a shot in the hand and maybe fracturing one of those bones. I think Derek has a slight guard on his elbow. It's, it's certainly not big, anything like what Barry Bonds has, but uh, almost like a sleeve device. It looks like more of a sleeve than any protection, though. Yeah. So here's Robinson Cano. They put him in the number three spot. And obviously, he comes up in a very, very big moment in the game here in the fourth. Base is loaded, and he is not a good bases loaded hitter. He has one grand slam, though. And there's a strike, count on one. And now the A's are concerned enough to get somebody up in the bullpen. And we saw him earlier as Dallas Braden. Cano, the eighth batter to come to the plate for the Yankees. He is struck out and grounded to first. Big spot in this game, eight four A's. Bases loaded with the Yankees, two outs. Blocked there by Kendall on the count one and one. Yankees showing some of that fight, some of that grit that has been questioned in recent days by some members of the team. Let's see if they could finish it. The one one. Two and one. But as we said, after the second inning, Joe Torre always preaches, take little bites. Well, they took two bites in the second, two bites here in the fourth, looking for a big gulp right now. But if not, you've still got five more innings of at-bats, and it's just 8-4. 2-1. Foul back, 2-2. Two and two. Good swing by Robinson Cano right there. He got a hanging split-finger fastball in the 2-1 count. Had a good swing, just fouled it off. And this is a hanger right here. This is the one he wants back. He's done a nice job in this at bat, just waiting for his pitch. He got it right there and he fouled it off. Now you're in a little bit of trouble. Heron could come with that good split finger or try and freeze you inside with the fastball. Two-two. Deep drive right field, but Cust is there. 
and he'll put it away for the final out of the inning. A little bit toward the end of the bat, and he didn't quite get the lift that he wanted, but the Yankees get two more runs on three hits, and they leave the bases loaded. We go to the fifth, it's getting interesting. Here in the Bronx, top of the fifth inning, it's eight, four A's. Ron Ballone deals to Dan Johnson, a line drive to right. Bobby Abreu is right there. One pitch, one out. What Ballone's doing now is allowing the Yankees to creep back into the game, John, because if he had come in and just kept giving it up, well, then the Yankees would not have had the uh, the incentive to try to come back. Yeah, and it just takes the wind out of your sails. You throw up a few zeros right here, and all of a sudden the Yankees are right back in this ball game. You've done the hard work. You've scored the four runs off of Heron to get yourself back in it. Now you play baseball for the second half of this ball game. There's Bobby Crosby against Vallone, and the pitch is outside 1-0. And a lot of relief pitchers in Joe Torre's pen who have started out middle relief and ended up pitching big innings late in ball games. Tanya Sturtz comes to mind. And a strike. Ron Vallone, a guy down in that bullpen, really hasn't found his niche yet, you know, yet with Mike Myers struggling against left handers. You might think about him coming in small games later on. Count one and two. I've always liked about Ron Valone. He challenges the strike zone. You know you're going to get a guy coming in throwing strikes. Doesn't throw as hard as he did back in the day, but still a veteran guy. Knows how to pitch. He attacks hitters. Swing and a miss, and Crosby down on strikes. Seven in a row for Ballone. Hey, if you can't catch it live, catch it later on WB Mason Presents Yankees Encore. It's a replay of every Yankees game that gives you a second chance to see all the excitement of Bombers baseball. WB Mason Presents Yankees Encore later after each game and again the next morning at 9, only on Yes. Dan Harron is either nodding or doing his Jerry Tarkanian imitation. And there's a strike to Kendall. And the count one and one. Kendall infield single in the second, then fly out to center in the third. We're in the fifth at the stadium. It is eight four. Oakland. 1-1. One, one. High fly ball, center field. Nice easy inning for Ron Ballone. Another 1-2-3 job as Melky puts it away. And Ballone has done an outstanding job. The end of four and a half, we're halfway through. 8-4 Oakland. Yankees baseball on Yes is brought to you in part by Infinity, who uses the power of design to create dynamic, beautiful automobiles. IO Digital Cable, the leader in HD, and HD is free with IO. And by Acura, Acura Advance. Little speedboat race on the Harlem River. Alex Rodriguez swings at the first pitch and a ground ball to Bobby Crosby. Across the diamond, one pitch, one out. So Alex is 0 for 2 with a walk and a run score today. Hey, after the game yesterday, Scott Proctor came outside the Yankee uh, dugout. Stadium was empty. It was about an hour after the game and had a ritual burning of all of his belongings. Nothing that the Yankees own, like the uniform or anything like that, or the cap, but his undershirts and stuff like that. Uh, he tried to burn away the bad spirits. His spike, his spikes, I think he burned too. His glove, maybe, you know, just trying to get rid of the demons, so to speak. And, you know, we talked about Kea Gawa, whatever it takes. And with Scott Proctor, same thing, whatever you need to do to get back on track. I mean, we're just lucky that there wasn't an accident because he's burning that stuff as Agawa's running by. You don't want anybody <laughs> to get, get hurt. Brian Bruni beginning to warm. You can't ask Valone to pitch six innings. 
but he has certainly given the Yankees what they need. He's done very well today. Now there's an old story about surfers that if they're going to surf and there's no waves and you keep going back and there's just no waves one of the surfers will sacrifice his surfboard ground ball to first Johnson's there set fire to it and hope that it creates waves so I don't know if that's what Scott was thinking about but maybe along those lines I think I can guarantee you he wasn't thinking about that really yes yeah, surfing and and I think he was just thinking it's time to uh, get rid of the old and in with the new and see if he can get back on track here in the second half. But I said it yesterday. I learned something every day working with you, Michael K. Okay? Well, I actually learned that today. Dallas Braden is up again. Pete Stendel, our great cameraman, who's a surfer, told me that story. So you learned it the same day I learned it. So Pete Stendel was trying to hang 10, and the Yankees were just trying to hang 10 on the scoreboard. That would give them a 10 8 victory. Ground ball by Matsui again he tries to pull an outside pitch and Harron has a recovery inning as he retires the Yankees in order one two three. We go to the sixth Oakland eight Yankees four right here on yes. Hey Yankee fans for the most extensive Yankees news and notes you have to visit yesnetwork.com. get game recap stats and video highlights from every game as well as the all new web exclusive video feature post game plus get informed get entertained and get it all only at yesnetwork.com we go to the sixth inning new pitcher for the Yankees it's Brian Bruni 8 10 and 0 for the A's 4 6 and 1 for the Yankees so Ballone was outstanding three and a third scoreless innings allowed just one hit one base runner and Bruni Allows Kotze to rip one inside first. Abreu fields quickly. He will hold Kotze to a single. Kotze is three for three. Well, Mark Kotze is three for three. He's seen three pitches today. All first pitch fastballs, and he gets another one from Bruni right here on the inside half. He's ready to go right from the get go. First pitch swinging. Nice job by Bobby Abreu, kind of getting on this ball quickly and holding Mark Kotze just a single. Is he just out of the reach of Andy Phillips? Bobby Bray does a nice job getting this ball quickly spinning and coming up with a strong throw holding Katsay to a single. There's Kurt Suzuki. He had an RBI single in that big seven run second inning for the A's. He's one for two struck out the other time. And Bruni starts him off inside. One and oh. Ron Valone did such a nice job in this ball game, throwing a few zeros up there. Brian Bruni trying to build on that and keep the Oakland A's right here and give your ball club a chance to chip away at this lead. Ballone kept the Yankees in the game and now he turns it over to Bruni and you know you might be sitting home and saying, well why did he take Ballone out he had done so well well you can't ask people to do something that they're not physically able to do and by that I mean he has not pitched extended innings this year and you know if you push him to five innings there's a chance you might hurt him and then not have him and that's not fair to Ron Ballone so you take the three and a third and hope that somebody else in the bullpen does the job. And you know what he pitched two innings yesterday did a nice yes. job in yesterday's ball game at the end of the ball game and does an outstanding job today and you get him out of there before the fatigue sets in and like you said he did his job now the rest of the bullpen has to do their job. Malone's a competitor he went to spring training and did not win a job and then elected to go down to Scranton Wilkes-Barre and try to work his way up and he did just that and in spring training he didn't have the velocity on the fastball. But he found it down in Scranton Wilkes-Barre and uh, now he's a, a serviceable left hander. When I mean, you're left handed you can throw hard you're going to get a job and you can throw strikes and you know the one thing about when uh, Ron Valone went down to triple A he went down there with the attitude I got to work and get my way back. There are a lot of veterans who go down there and you know maybe they, they don't feel sorry for themselves but they feel like they're getting a raw deal. Ron Valone was not one of those guys. 
He worked his way back and now he gets an opportunity to today to show Joe Torre what he can do and he took advantage of it. And boy he works hard when when the Yankees are on the road and you get up in the morning you go to the workout room Ron Ballone is there already he's been putting in a couple of hours that's before he even gets to the ballpark so being a major leaguer is important to him staying in shape is important to him and the all of that manifested itself in the last couple of days with five and a third shutout innings. Being a Yankee is important to him. And, you know, a Jersey guy enjoys being at home, playing for the home team, the Yankees. You know, you just, you know, you constantly look at Joe Torrey's bullpen. He's looking for guys to step up. And, you know, Ron Ballone did that job today for him. Runner goes on the 3 2. It's foul back. Sixteenth sellout of the year here at Yankee Stadium. All three games of this A series sold out. Yankees have already sold four million tickets. Three two runner goes again. It popped up. Andy Phillips is there and he'll make the catch. One away. So one down back to the top of the lineup and Shannon Stewart. I was thinking about this yesterday John and you know we were talking about it's hard for a player to really enjoy what's going on while he's you know locked in and trying to perform. But there are fifty five thousand people here and people make such a big deal out of somebody performing on Broadway. And I went to Susan Waldman today Yankee radio announcer I said what's the biggest house on Broadway. And she said 2,200 people. I started to think, what's the big deal then? The lines are the same every single day. And here, it changes every pitch, and you've got to perform in front of 55,000 people. There's no comparison. You know, the, my first thought there, it, once you play in the major leagues, 55,000 or 20,000, I mean, it really was no difference. You were so locked in on what you had to do on the field. You know, obviously young players come up to the major leagues and they get intimidated by the stadiums and the crowd. Once you become a veteran guy you really become you know numb to the whole thing and you just locked in on what you have to do how you have to get people out how you have to get hits. It's just funny to me that you know even if you foul up a line on Broadway you're not getting booed here fifty five thousand people will boo you if you don't do well. I mean, that's a lot of pressure. And then forget about just the live crowd. Hopefully, you have millions watching on television and millions listening on radio. So that's a lot of pressure. I, I'm not certainly not serving up an excuse for people, but it's a lot of pressure to perform like that. You have to have a lot of respect for major league ball players to be able to do this day in and day out. This this is Broadway. The one one fouled away. I know I've said it before, but you know I was always amazed. Like I would look back at the end of the year, and Charlie Wansowitz, the video guy, would send you. A DVD of all your hits and your mm. home runs and your good plays, and you would watch it in the off season, and you were kind of like in awe of the whole theater, like you're talking about the crowd cheering and the dramatics about it. When you're out there doing it, it doesn't feel like that, mm. you know, because your mind is racing on different thoughts on how to hit pitchers, like I said, and you know, for me being a catcher, how to get lineups out, and you never really enjoyed it when you're out on the field. So you've spoken about that a lot over the last couple of days, and I wonder. Is it because you were a catcher that you couldn't take it all in. I wonder if Melky Cabrera standing out there in center field with a lot of time on his hands can look around and go wow I'm playing center field at Yankee Stadium and there's 55,000 people watching us. Well Melky Cabrera is looking in towards home plate he sees this crowd you know the great thing about being a catcher you're looking out towards center field and yeah you see the crowd in the bleachers and right center and left center but you're, you're so focused on your pitcher where your defenders are playing. You know you see the, the view from center field you're going to see all of this the upper deck and the, and the big crowds. He probably does have time to enjoy it. being a catcher you never had that luxury. 
You know when you enjoyed it in the clubhouse after the ball game, mm -hmm. you know, and you were kind of having dinner. Robbie Kakuza throw some great spreads down there, and you know you'd have dinner, have a nice meal, talk to your teammates about the ball game, and then when you're driving home, you're thinking about the next day's game and what pitcher you're going to face. Missed inside the count three and two on Stewart. Along with that former catcher John Flaherty, I'm Michael Kay, and you're watching Yankees baseball. Right here on yes, top of the sixth inning, Oakland leads the Yankees 8 4. Runner goes again, the throw to second. The tag is made, and they say that Stewart did not hold up. So it's a strike him out, throw him out, double play. For some reason, Kotze stopped running, which you should never do, assuming that it was ball four. So no runs hit, and nobody left. We go to the bottom of the six, eight four Oakland. Let's take a look at the low jack caught stealing at the end of that inning. And it's going to be a high fastball. And Mark Kotze, he thinks that Shannon Stewart did not swing, so he stops. And like you said, Michael, one of those things that you just don't do. And you see here, Jorge Posada comes down and gives a nice strong throw. He actually finished and hit Shannon Stewart's bat, which you're going to worry about his fingers, maybe cracking a bone in his hand. Hopefully he'll be all right. And he went off the field shaking his hand in pain. Take a look as he clips the end of the bat. He looks to see if he got the guy out and then feels the pain. You know, you look at Yogi Berra's hands, and his fingers are all gnarled. Yours look like they're in pretty good shape. Did you break your fingers ever? I uh, I shattered a few fingers. I shattered the middle finger on my left hand, and actually, Abreu lines one to center field. Kotze one away. A good sign for Bobby Abreu. Last at bat, sacrifice fly to left field. There, a line drive to center. Maybe his stroke was coming around. But I remember fracturing the my middle finger on my left hand. When Bernie Williams was attempting a sacrifice bunt, I was with the Tampa Bay Devil Rays, and he was attempting a sacrifice bunt, and he did one of those things where he puts it right in your eyesight right. and brings it back. And I went to catch the ball and actually shattered this finger to end my season. I think it was my last year with Tampa Bay. Hot shot and pass to Diving Crosby for a base hit. Andy Phillips is three for three. So it just hit the glove wrong and pulled the finger. Well, what, what happened was I'm, I'm looking for the pitch and Bernie kind of put the bat in my eyesight. And as he brought it back this way, I couldn't see where the ball was. And I kind of reached for the ball and it just shattered right off of the back of my glove and shattered this finger and actually um, finished the rest of the game and then went upstairs and got an X-ray. And it was it was the day was over. The year was over that year with, because of that finger. And I saw Ray Fossey, who's announces for Oakland and, you know, a catcher and his hands were all mangled. And you really, I mean, let's be honest, you've never liked Bernie Williams since, right? We uh, we had a very, very nice relationship. <laughs> Bernie, one of those guys, there's Ray Fossey, and you know, he actually uh, shook my son's hand today, and I pointed out Ray's right hand with all the broken bones and looked kind of nasty. But, you know, th those old-school catchers like Ray, they used to catch with that right hand out in front of their body, so mm -hmm. they would take a lot of the foul tips off of their right hand. You watch a lot of the modern catchers now that right hand is more behind the back or behind the right shin guard so they protect it a little bit more. Served into left field a base hit for Cabrera and the Yankees have runners on first and second with one out and the top of the order coming up. This is not a great performance by Heron and it's not but you got to give a little credit to the bottom of the order here Melky Cabrera gets his second base hit a nice pitch down and away he goes the other way with it. Andy Phillips has three hits today. So five hits between the eight and nine guys in the Yankee order. And it can't be the Alex Rodriguez is every day Jorge Posadas Derek Jeters. It's got to be the other guys as well. Well Bob Guerin has seen enough. He's going to signal to the bullpen and he's going to hold his breath because the bullpen has not been good for the A's. First and second with one out. We'll be back. Hey stop by and visit our friends at JNR Music and Computer World. Well, Danny Heron did not have his best game of the year. Five and a third, eight hits, four runs. The two runners on base are his responsibility. He walked two, struck out five, 101 pitches, and Dallas Braden will come on to face Johnny Damon. You can see the numbers for Braden right there. 25 hits in the 23 innings, and, you know, he showed us a pretty good fastball in this series. 
And he's got a screwball, which is a little unusual. He didn't throw it an awful lot his last outing, but he's got a good one. And it's interesting because the Yankees did see him on Friday. Let's see if they put a book together and went to school on him on Friday as well. Here's Johnny Damon, first and second, one out. There's a breaking ball strike whispering across the outside corner, 0 1. And we talked about this game, you know, a great pitcher's matchup, Andy Pettit and Heron. And, you know, Andy had a tough afternoon. You give him a pass. He's been throwing the ball so well all year. Heron, the same way. You know, a great year, 1.9 ERA, and he just had a tough one today. He still can get the win, obviously. His ERA is going to suffer a bit. But the A's are just looking for wins. As we mentioned, they've had an awful, awful road trip. And the Yankees can sympathize just coming off a bad road trip of their own. Ties him up, check swing. He did not go, said Angel Hernandez. No mission accomplished for the Yankees, though. You get a tough starter out of the ball game. Now you're into that middle relief in that pen. And this is what the game plan was when you're down early, 8 0, was to get the starting pitcher Heron out of the ball game and see if you can do some damage off of the bullpen. Good off speed pitch in the count, 2 and 2. Yeah, we saw some pretty good fastballs from Braden the other night, and here's a nice slider, good break down and away on it. Johnny Damon fooled by the speed and the break. See if he goes to it again, trying to expand the strike zone down and away. The 2 2 came inside with the fastball in the count full at three and two. Yankees are two for nine with runners in scoring position in this game, and to amplify that in the series they are three for 19 with runners in scoring position. Three two grounded foul. Garcia warming up. We have not seen him yet in this series. Tap slowly back to the mound. Let's see if they turn two. There's one. Not in time. Game in too quick. Nice scoop by Johnson. Might have saved a run. If it got by him, that would have allowed Phillips to score. Well, Johnny Damon running better right now. Braden actually does a nice job right here for a young kid. Comes up with a nice strong throw to second base to Crosby. But Johnny just runs too well to beat this one out. See him getting down the line. The legs much healthier. Good sign for the Yankees. So here's Derek Jeter. Derek 0 for 2. And was hit by a pitch in the Yankees two on fourth inning. Yankees had the bases loaded in that inning, had closed it to 8 4, and Robinson Cano just missed one, hit it off the end of the bat, fairly deep right field for the final out. Jeter fouls it away. And the 0-1. Grounded foul. And the count 0-2. Cheater a little late. We mentioned in his last at bat, he is 0 for 10 in this series. He's a 5-15 hitter with two outs and runners in scoring position since May 26, 3 for 11. 5-15, that's obscene. Runners on the corners with two outs. Bottom of the sixth, Oakland leads the Yankees 8-4. drive base it to right field a run will score Damon advances to second it's an RBI single for Jeter and the Yankees have closed it within eight five 
Andy Phillips had a big two out RBI earlier in this ball game and that's really the way you're going to close this gap is with two outs. You got to pick up the big hits the big RBIs. Jason Kendall setting up inside the ball was just out over the plate right where Derek Jeter likes it. And you said it before he was tied up the pitch before Michael and that pitch right there just did him a favor. The ball out over the plate he was able to catch up and drive it to right field. Now another big at bat for Robinson Cano. They moved in him into the number three hole today. He's 0 for 3. Last time up, bases loaded. Now first and second. He's the tying run at the plate. Not that you want to stop right here, but when you're down 8 nothing after an inning and a half, and in the sixth inning, you could bring the tying run up to the plate. They did that in the fifth as well. You've done a pretty nice job. Obviously, they want to complete the climb up the mountain. I mentioned it before you start looking forward and you know what a big game this would be if the Yankees could fight back and, and pick up a W right here. If you're Robinson Cano you had to go to school watching Johnny Damon face this young left hander Braden showing a good slider he's shown that he can throw a fastball in on left handed hitters which is a little bit unusual. If you're Robinson Cano when you're in that dugout you have to be paying attention to those at bats and see if you can pick up some tendencies. The one one missed outside two and one Mike Myers and Luis Vizcaino warming for the Yankees Torrey's trying to piece it together in the bullpen Dan Harron's now only a spectator the two one right in on the hands and he fouls it back two and two Robinson has had some mistakes today some hangers that he's fouled off that one right there a slider that just stayed up in the zone that probably wants back that's a pitch you really can do some damage with see Kendall setting up away and it just spins middle middle in probably hung it just enough that it tied him up but another mistake that he's fouled off. The 2-2. Two -two. Fouled away. Still 2-2. Two and two. That's really the difference when you're facing Major League Pitching. You know, when they make that one mistake, you really have to put it in play because you figure they're not going to make more than one mistake during an at-bat. Robinson got his mistake, fouled it off. Now you got to go into a little defensive mode, just try and put the ball in play and pick out a base hit, another two-out RBI. Braden deals. Did he go? Yes, he did, said Angel Hernandez. Tried to hold up on the fastball inside, so Cano is 0 for 4, batting in the three slot. For the Yankees, they get a run on three hits, no errors, and two men left. Continue to chip away. Eight five A's. Hey, today after the postgame, catch another fun-filled episode of Yankees on Deck. This week, learn how to climb the walls like Melky Cabrera. Plus, Doug Minkiewicz and Don Mattingly hang with the guys from the Tampa Fire and Rescue Academy. It's another Yankees on Deck today after the postgame right here on Yes. Well, we go to the seventh inning. Brian Bruni's still on, and he will face Mark Ellis as the Yankees try to hold it right here at 8-5. And the pitch is a strike. Ellis today is one for two with a sack fly a run scored. Served to right field a base hit nice piece of hitting by Ellis and Abreu gets the ball and that's got to um, probably chop a catcher and a pitcher. It's not a bad pitch but a nice piece of hitting by Ellis. Yeah you have to tip your hat right here. I mean the ball's on the outside corner and you see it just kind of flips at it. Nice base hit the other way. Mark Ellis, one of those players that really underrated playing on the West Coast. Good numbers offensively and known as a fine defensive infielder. Brian Bruni's day looks like it's going to be over. Well, now the left-hander Jack Cust is going to come up, and they're going to give Mike Myers another opportunity. He has not done well against lefties. Let's see what he does now against Cust. We'll be back. Yankees trail 8-5. 
Time to take a look at the game summary presented by Sharp Aquas, the official HD TV of Major League Baseball. All of this is going to add up to Oakland 8, the Yankees 5. Yankees fell behind early 8-0 after an inning and a half. Oakland just punished Andy Pettit in the second inning to the tune of seven runs. But the Yankees have climbed back. It's 8-5 now here in the seventh. And Mike Myers is on to face the lefty Jack Cust. You see what Myers has done. The numbers are not that bad, but the numbers against left-handers are bad. And how about this? John, we spoke about this yesterday. Mike Myers has moved off the third base side of the rubber, and he's moved toward the first base side of the rubber to be more effective against lefties. Yeah, and it all goes back to the deception. You know, you want him to be the feeling like he's going to throw behind the left-handed hitter's back. And the one thing that was alarming last night when he faced Jack Cust, who's, you know, a, an older young player, I guess is the best way to put it. I mean, he doesn't have a lot of experience at the big leagues, but he felt very comfortable off of Mike Myers last night. He worked a walk, and it just looked like he was seeing the ball very well. Mike Myers made an adjustment today. And the thing with this Oakland lineup, it is set up to showcase the value of a Myers. You've got Cust, Chavez, Johnson you've got those three lefties in a row and if Myers is right I mean it counteracts a whole inning for the A's and what we were saying yesterday about Myers being on the third base out of the rubber they had moved him there so he could be more effective against righties but his job is to get lefties out and you see Lefties hit 314 against him, so it was successful against righties. But the purpose for him being on the team is to get out left-handers. So obviously they they considered that overnight. Now they moved him back to the first base side. Now, is it unusual, John, to, to move from one side of the rubber to the other, from batter to batter? Well, from batter to batter, it is unusual. We'll see how he adjusts right here. And it's one of those things. You go down the bullpen, you work on it, you try and get comfortable with it again. But you can see he got behind three and zero. Oh right away probably trying to figure out his mechanics find his release point he's gotten back to a full count right here but you want to be over to this side of the rubber just because you're going to get deception coming from down here it's going to make it tougher for those left handers to pick the ball up three two count on cust Ellis is at first and they want to make sure that Ellis not going on the three two. It looks like he's thinking about it over there. He kind of flinched when Mike Myers went over. And, you know, if you're the Yankees, you're thinking strike him out, throw him out right here. Mike Myers throws that good sweeping slider that he's had in the past. You get a strike him out, throw him out if you're the Yankees. That one's drilled out to left center field. It is going to be trouble. It splits the outfielders, and it rolls to the wall. Ellis will round third. He will score. And Cusk stops at second with an RBI double. And Oakland leads 9-5. Well, the struggles continue for Mike Myers facing the left-handed hitters and Jack Cuss we talked about it earlier in this ball game likes the ball out over the plate and it's the fastball it's not the slider tried to freeze him with a fastball away and Cuss was ready for it just drives it the other way to the gap hit a three-run homer earlier in this ball game off of Andy Pettit the left-hander and here drives a double the other way off of Mike Myers the lefty it's four RBIs for him today. And the pitch inside. And the count 2 and 0, and uh, Posada wants to go out and talk with Myers. And you, know, you brought up a good point, John. It's not as simple as just moving to the other side of the rubber because he's been used to attacking the strike zone 22 inches away from where he is right now that's the length of the rubber out on the pitcher's mound so there's a little bit of an adjustment there yeah, there's an adjustment you know the one thing that just jumps out at me when I watch Mike Myers pitch is the slider is not as big as it was the sweeper is not as big as it was I don't know if it's a lack of velocity or a different arm angle but he just doesn't have that deception and that big sweeper to get the lefties out that he had in the past. And the count three and zero. Oh. And you can feel it here, Michael, with the crowd. You know, one run that has been given up by the bullpen now, and it's almost like a deflated feeling. The Yankees have been battling their way back, chipping away at the lead, and all of a sudden you give up a, an RBI double, and it's kind of deflating to the Yankees and this home crowd. It's 
So he's gone 3-0 on both lefties and now 3-1 on both lefties. He worked at 3-2 on cusp before giving up that big two RBI double. Hit sharply right at Cano. One away. So Chavez down for the first out. But gets, that'll bring up Dan Johnson. He gets behind in the count. He comes in with a 3-0 fastball, which is understandable. But, you know, on a 3-1 count, left on left, and your bread and butter is that big sweeping slider. You expect him to throw it and be able to throw it for a strike. He went with the fastball, and Chavez hit it well. He just lined out. And Joe's going to go for Vizcaino. He made the same move yesterday. He'd rather have Vizcaino walk Johnson intentionally and then take his chance with Bobby Crosby hitting into the double play. So a little bit more of an indictment of Myers. A double, a hard line drive, and taking him out when another lefty's in there will be bad. Well, fans, come out to the stadium on Tuesday, July 3rd, as the first 18,000 fans, 21 and over, will receive a DVD of Game 1 from the 1977 World Series, courtesy of A&E Home Video. For tickets, log on to Yankees.com. You can visit the Yankee Stadium ticket window, Yankees Clubhouse Shops, or you can call Ticketmaster at 212-307-1212. So now it's Luis Fizcaino's turn, and slowly but surely he's bringing the ERA down. He's bringing the numbers to where they should be, and the thing that he can bring down, but he could stop right there is 28 walks. He's a better pitcher than that, and ever since he got taken under the wing of Mariano Rivera, John, for some reason, that has resonated with him, and he's become a better pitcher. His slider's had a little bit more bite, and he's got a little more jump on the fastball. Yeah, I think the slider has improved, but I, you know, I think the confidence that he's able to throw that pitch for a strike right now, it's a weapon for him. And just like yesterday's ball game, we're going to see him intentionally walk Dan Johnson and take his chances with the shortstop Crosby. And that is exactly the scenario that took place yesterday. And you feel for Mike Myers, who is who is a very, very good guy and uh, a pleasant person in the clubhouse and a guy that the media can go to. Been in the game a long time, but right now, the job that he is paid to do, he is not doing uh, to the level of his satisfaction of the Yankees. And uh, it's got to be puzzling to him and to Joe Torre. So an intentional walk to Dan Johnson. Well, you wonder what goes through a guy's mind. I mean, is he thinking about his future? It's probably gnawing away at him. Well, he's thinking, how do I figure this out? You know, I made an adjustment today going to the other side of the, of the rubber, and it didn't work out real well. My location wasn't good, got behind in the count. You know, how do I get that big sweeper back? You know, you're trying to go through all the mechanical keys that you've used your whole career and trying to see if something sticks. And there's a strike to Bobby Crosby. Along with John Flaherty, I'm Michael Kay. You're watching Yankees baseball here on the Yes Network. We thank you for spending part of your Sunday afternoon with us. Oakland leads the Yankees 9 to 5, top of the seventh inning on a beautiful day at Yankee Stadium. The 0 1. Again, that slider away, and the count 1 and 1. Vizcaino looks to be closer to the pitcher that he was last year with the Diamondbacks. And if he regains that form, there's a good chance that he could end up being the eighth inning guy who's a bridge to Mariano Rivera because right now that bridge is somewhat shaky. 1-1. One, one. There's a strike. You count one and two. And you come in this situation, you know, you're, you're intentionally walking the lefty to get to the right-hander with one out. You're thinking double play, and there are a few ways to try and get that. He's thrown three sliders in a row. You can try and get Crosby, the right-handed hitter, to look for the ball out over the plate and then maybe jam him and see if you can get a double play ground ball or go off the plate with a slider. He jammed him. And Crosby swings and misses two away. And that's perfect execution right there. I mean, three sliders on the outside corner, and then you go inside with a sinking fastball, a riding fastball, 92 miles an hour. He gets a strikeout. But even if he didn't get the strikeout, you would be tying up the right-handed hitter and probably get a weak ground ball, possibly a double play grounder. But he picked up the strikeout. Here's Jason Kendall first and second now two outs Yankees down by four nine to five trying to stop it right here. 
Oakland four for eight today with runners in scoring position. They've had a good series. Seven for 21 with runners in scoring position. Bob Guerin hoping that his team just treads water until it gets healthy. At least pitching wise in the bullpen. The 0 1. There's a strike 0 and 2. You could just see Vizcaino is throwing with so much more confidence than he was, I'd say, three weeks ago. Yeah, and it's all come off of the slider. It's like he's got confidence that he knows every time he throws a slider, it's going to be a strike. It's probably going to be located on the outside corner. He's been ahead of both of the right handed hitters now, now looking for another strikeout or third out to get out of this inning. You got to be careful with Kendall with two strikes and runners in scoring position. He'll look for the ball out over the plate and just try and go up the middle the other way. A lot of these hitters change situationally. If there's nobody on, they're trying to pull the ball a little bit more. Runners on base in scoring position, they try and go the other way. Mariano Rivera has obviously touched on something that works with Vizcaino, and he obviously asked the permission of Torrey and Guidry before he did it. And I once asked Rivera, would you ever want to be a pitching coach? And he said no and you see how Mo works with him and he, they work in the outfield they don't even work in the bullpen they work in the outfield and he said I, I wouldn't want to be a pitching coach because when I retire I want to be with my family more he said but what I want to do is go down to spring training every year and work with the young pitchers can you imagine Mariano Rivera teaching a young pitcher here's how you do the throw the cutter it's not a bad spring training instructor for the Yankees to have the O2. And there's a looper and it's caught by Jeter and Vizcaino does a nice job works out of further trouble one big run two hits no errors and two men left at the end of six and a half it's time for the seventh inning stretch here at the stadium Oakland leads the Yankees 9 five stay where you are as we honor America here in the Bronx by listening to the voice of Yankee Stadium Mr. Bob Shepard. Nancy Newman back in our Yes Studios with this Tri-State Ford update. Big news out of Seattle. It is official just about 30 minutes ago. Manager Mike Hargrove announced his resignation. I am, uh, after today's game, uh, will resign as manager of the Seattle, uh, manager of the Seattle Mariners. Um, there are no uh, dark, sinister reasons for this decision. More on the post game. Back to our game and Michael and John at the stadium. Very interesting comments by Mike Hargrove, but amazingly, he's going to manage today's game. Today's game, yeah. I mean, if you're going to resign, resign before the game. Uh, how awkward is that? Really, a lame duck manager. New pitcher, Santiago Casilla. You see his numbers, and they're very good. And John, this guy is literally the player to be named later. He pitched for the A's a couple of years ago. His name was Hilo Castilla. And then they checked his birth certificate and found out he was three years older and was not Hilo Casilla. He was actually Santiago Casilla. So he is the player to be named later. And that's happened to a bunch of players. And, you know, but he's he's the one guy that has been called up that has really stepped up and taken advantage of an opportunity. He throws hard, 93, 94 miles an hour. He's got a good little deceptive arm action, a little three quarters, going to give him some movement, but they've been very happy with his progress. And the count 0 and 2 on A Rod. A Rod today is 0 for 2 with a walk. Swing and a miss. A Rod down on strikes. Wow, so the combination of a good fastball with some movement, and then he's got some nasty sliders that he's able to throw on the outside corner. And you're going to see the good break, the good sharp action on that pitch right there. Little deceptive delivery. Three quarters over the top, and good break gives him good action on that slider. Here is Posada.
You know it's interesting John I think you hit it right on the nose that run in the seventh inning you would say well it's just a run but it stopped everything boom it killed the momentum you could feel the the plug was pulled on the crowd and if the plug is pulled on the crowd you wonder if the plug is also pulled on the Yankees it's like they're climbing a greased pole and then that one run made them slide down just a little bit again. Well it's just you're scratching and clawing and trying to do whatever you can to get back in that ball game and like you said it's only one run but it just felt like it was a mo momentum changer. Then you get a you know a, a right hander here who's got some pretty good numbers one of the real bright spots out of the bullpen they don't have too many. The Yankees are going to have to find a way to do some damage off of them. Grounded right side and through for base hit. So Posada is two for three with a walk. You know, John, it's so important. If you're going to make big statements, you've got to come up big because it looks so disingenuous if you don't. And Posada has come up big in this game. You know what? He's been hitting all year. I mean, he's having a, a, an outstanding year, an all-star type year. But you said it right, Michael. If you're going to open your mouth and talk about maybe the lack of effort and you know we all know what's going on that type of thing and you come back the next day and get two hits you know you just back up your statements out on the field and that's one thing Jorge Posada when he talks in the clubhouse he, he backs it up out on the field the next day and the pitch to Matsui is a strike you know this is Derek Jeter's team he's the captain of the team and uh, no one argues that but there are guys that are not titled captains that have a lot of influence in a clubhouse. And Posada's one of those guys in uh, in earlier times, Tino Martinez, never really got a lot of play. You know, you heard about the O'Neills and you know Jeter at the time was a cat, but Tino Martinez was one of the leaders of the team. So just because a guy is not the captain of the team doesn't mean that he's not a leader on the team. And Posada is one of the more vocal guys in that clubhouse. You know, and he, he just fits in perfectly with this Yankee team. He kind of flies under the radar. Alex gets a lot of attention. Derek Jeter a lot of attention, and rightfully so. You know, but Jorge is one of those guys in the clubhouse. He's vocal with the pitchers. He's vocal with his position players, and all he wants to do is win. I mean, I was very impressed in spring training. You're going through contract talks, Mariano Rivera. What's going to happen with him? And Posada said, you know what? Let's worry about it later. I just want to win, and that's what he's all about. Matsui loses the bat and swings and misses two and two. He's respected around the league but you know more importantly he's respected in that clubhouse as one of the leaders. And you can see Hideki Matsui just not seeing the ball real well he's pulling off and loses a grip on the bat. An awkward swing. You know if you read some of the books that have been written about the 96 98 99 2000 Yankees. The one guy who does jump out of as, as an unbelievable leader that people were like afraid of in that room was Tino. I mean you did not want to play hard or not play hard and then have to face Tino Martinez because he got angry and he got right in your grill and you'd never see you never think that watching him on the field but he was the guy that you did not want to encounter if you were not doing things the right way or the Yankee way. High fly ball fairly deep left Stewart back. And he'll make the play as Posada heads back to first. And on that early Yankee team, Chili Davis was that way. Tim Raines was that way. Daryl Strawberry was that way. There were a lot of those pockets of players that had veteran leadership skills and didn't have to trumpet it by saying, I'm, I'm the man here. But within that, clubhouse they they said what had to be said and Derek Jeter has said that, that Chili Davis and Tim Raines were two of his greatest teammates he ever had hmm. here's a brave grounded to first Johnson steps on the bag and that will do it here in the seventh no runs a hit no errors and one man left on base we go to the eighth it's nine five Oakland Hey fans, today and throughout the Yankee season on Yes, we're allowing you to vote along with the two of us here in the booth for the Chevrolet Player of the Game. Text your vote to 58772, or for more information, visit ChevyOffers.com. 
You can vote right up until the end of the game. Vote now and make your voice heard. Today's candidates are number one, Jack Cust, number two, Dan Johnson, number three, Andy Phillips, and number four, Ron Ballone, who quietly did a very, very good job today. Standard text messaging rates apply. Luis Vizcaino against Katze, Suzuki, and Stewart, eight, nine, and one. We're in the eighth, nine, five A's. And the count, one and oh, nine, 13 and oh, beating five, 10 and one. Barcatze finally took a first pitch. He's three for three, only seen three fastballs. Swinging first pitch all day. Finally took a fastball outside right there. And the count, two and oh. Three for three came into this game, five for his last 33, so he needed this game. Yesterday he was 0 for 4. And Friday, 1 for 4. Yankees finally retire him today. And there's one away here in the eighth. Let's take a look at the A's in game box score sponsored by Hummer. 13 hits for Oakland, two by Ellis, three by Cust. His parents and grandparents are at the ballpark. So he's got to be thrilled. A home run, a double, and four ribbies. Chavez, one for four. Dan Johnson, a home run, two ribbies. Bobby Crosby, Jason Kendall, Mark Kotze have all scored runs. And Kurt Suzuki, one for three, a ribby, and a run scored. And here is the aforementioned Kurt Suzuki. And there's a strike. Vizcaino got the final two outs of the seven. Foul back. And the count 0 2. I've been impressed with Suzuki's swing. It's a kind of a short, little compact, looks like a little powerful swing. Two home runs already. Doesn't have a whole lot of at bats. Kind of gets in a position, loaded up right there as a nice short, quick stroke. Count one and two. Reading up on his career a little bit, you know, he actually had a, had a scholarship to Hawaii. He's from Hawaii and decided to forego that and walked on to Cal State Fullerton because he thought the baseball would be better, the exposure would be better, and he ended up gets drafted and now a prospect. Skips rope to get out of the way. Well, either college you're going to get good weather. Cal State Fullerton or Hawaii. Nine five Oakland leads top of the eighth. The two two. There's that slider. Good bite on it. Check swing by Suzuki and Mark Carlson said he did not go. So the count is full of three and two. Just off the plate and Suzuki obviously didn't swing right there. With three two count we'll see how comfortable this guy you know is with that slider if he has the confidence to throw a three and two to the number nine hitter in the lineup. Looks like he's going with the fastball. Now they change to the slider. And that's lined in the left field, a base hit. So Suzuki is two for four. That wasn't a slider, that was an off speed pitch. Well, it looked like he was just trying to throw for a strike three and two, which is what you're supposed to do. You know, you're hoping that the hitter is just going to be looking for a fastball. And it was a slider. It was just up for a strike. And you, you have to tip your hat a little bit there to Suzuki, a young hitter, able to stay on an off-speed pitch, three and two in the zone. Picks up another base hit. And three and two right there, three-two count, number nine hitter. You just want to make sure you throw a strike. And it just shows you the confidence Vizcaino has in that slider now as opposed to earlier in the year. Shannon Stewart fouls it away. 
essentially though John he hung that slider it was up in the zone but three and two you want to throw for a strike you know the worst thing that you do is you throw a slider off the plate and you walk him. and you, you know you're kind of kicking yourself like why didn't I challenge the number nine guy who's a young backup catcher he threw him a slider or threw it for a strike and I tip my hat to Suzuki there's a strike now you're talking an 0 2 count if you're going to throw the slider you want to start it on the outside corner and have it finish off the plate see if Stewart will chase it problem with this guy he likes the ball out over the plate so much and likes hitting the ball the other way so much that you want to probably want to go inside maybe now they're going to go with a slider off the plate grounded inside third and down the left field line kicks out toward Matsui Suzuki will go to third going to second is Stewart he's in there with a double Sometimes when you have the game plan you just don't execute it you get an 0 and 2 count you want to go slider down off the plate and it ends up middle right here as you can see and it's a mistake that Shannon Stewart just gets out front and hooks it down the third base line you know a lot of different ways when you get 0 and 2 but the one thing that you want to do is make sure you throw a pitch out of the strike zone and see if you can get the hitter to chase it right there a mistake in the middle of the plate. Yankees have to bring the infield in. They can't afford to fall any further behind. And the pitch to Mark Ellis is inside 1 0. Suzuki is at third, Stewart at second. Almost hit him, spun out of the way. And now Ron Guidry sees something and uh, he's going to go out and talk with Vizcaino. Well, the story of this game, it happened early. Oakland with a run in the first inning, a couple of bloopers and a, a fielder's choice ground out. They had an early 1 0 lead. Then in the second, it all fell apart for Andy Pettit, the Yankee starter. Seven runs on seven hits, two home runs, one by Cust and one by Johnson. Pettit was taken out of the game. Uh, Ron Ballone came on to get the final out of the second, then pitched a scoreless third, fourth, and fifth. They turned it over to the bullpen and uh, a scoreless sixth inning for Bruni. Then the Yankees gave up a run in the seventh, which proved to be big. And now Scott Proctor warming for the Yankees in their bullpen, and uh, the A's are trying for another run here in the eighth. The Yankees have tried to chip away two in the second two in the fourth and one in the sixth but it is a high hill to climb the 2 0 count three and oh you got to believe Ron Guidry saw something mechanically right there to go out to this guy you know and have a little conversation with him it looks like he's losing balls up and to the right in the strike zone up and in on the right handed batters usually a sign that that front shoulder is flying open your arm doesn't have time to catch up there's a strike count three and one. two runs out on the bases so important to the Yankees if you can keep them out there you limit the damage right here in a 3 1 count you just don't want to give in to Ellis and give him a cookie out over the plate to get a base hit and the pitch up and in so Ellis walks and that loads the bases and it gives the local boy Jack Cust another opportunity to get a big hit. Take a look at Jack Cust early in the ball game. It's a fastball. It's middle of the plate, and he drives it out to just right of center field for a three-run home run. He's had a big day today. If you're Vizcaino and Posada, you want to be thinking double play, and really the only way to do that with this guy is keep the ball down and keep it away from him. He's a pretty patient hitter, doesn't chase too many pitches out of the strike zone. You can pitch him down and away with a little bit of movement, maybe some off speed pitches down and away. See if you can get him to roll one over to Robinson Cano. Yankees bring the infield to double play depth. Cuss trying to uh, hit a granny right there, count on one. A lot of family and friends of Jack Cust here in the crowd. He's from Flemington, New Jersey. Has not yet gotten a hit with the bases loaded in his career. 
and of particular note cost parents and grandparents in the crowd here at the stadium. Count 0 and 2. And now what do you do on this 0-2? Well, you want to make sure it's a ball. And like I said, you know, down and away, try and bounce it. You have faith in Jorge Posada that he's going to block this pitch. But just what you did right there, it looked like two change-ups on the outside corner. And you had Cust out in front of him. And you can take your chance right here with an 0-2 pitch, maybe throw one up and in to set up an off-speed pitch down and away. I would just stay down and away and off-speed. Bases loaded with one out. And now Cust wants time. Suzuki's at third. Stewart at second and Ellis is at first and Posada goes out for another mound conference along with John Flaherty. I'm Michael Kay. You're watching Yankees baseball right here on the Yes Network. It's 9 5 top of the eighth inning. The A's are threatening for more athletics lead trying to win this series two games to one. And the 0-2. Way outside, 1-2. and It looks like he tried to finish him there with a slider that was down and in, and he just was a little quick with it and ended up up and away. You know, if you're thinking double play, I mean, you, now you got 1-2. and two, you got a chance to strike him out, so you're probably thinking strikeout. But if you're thinking double play, it's always going to be down and away to this left-hander and see if you can get a roll one over to Robinson Cano. 1-2. Missed inside and the count now two and two. And it's a slider in. We talked about the confidence that he has in this pitch right now. Trying to get a strikeout go down and into uh, Jack Cuss. He just left it up. Threw him some good changeups early in this at bat. You know, got to get to 0 and 2, and obviously Cust was fooled with the speed of them. I think he might try and go back to it here. And now the count is full. No place to put Cust. And Eric Chavez is on deck. Suzuki Stewart and Ellis third to first bases loaded one out and the three two to cuss he struck him out big strikeout for Bruce Cayeno. he made the big pitch when he had to and it looks like it's an off speed pitch with that good movement down and away 87 miles an hour they're a hard change up or took a little bit off the two seamer. Whatever it was, the location was perfect. Down and away, ball moving away from Cust. And here is Chavez. He is one for four. Has a ribby and a run score. Good live fastball to count 0 and 1. Again, this batter imperative that the Yankees have a chance to come back. Down by four, two innings left, but any more than that becomes a somewhat arduous task for the Yankees. And it's not going to be easy at four. Yeah, the only good news is Alan Embry is the closer on this team now that Houston Street is hurt, and he struggled his last uh, few outings in Cleveland, known more as a setup guy than a closer. So if you're the Yankees, you think you might be able to do something against him. And there's a big base hit for Chavez. Suzuki scores, Stewart scores, and a two-run single for the A's third baseman, and Oakland leads 11 to five. You said it, Michael, a huge base hit right there. You know, you give up any runs late in this ballgame, you know your job is going to be that much tougher. 
And Chavez just gets a ball out over the plate up a little bit but just stays with it doesn't try and do too much and drives it right back up the middle. Biscaino that close to getting out of the inning but gives up a big two out base hit. Well with that base hit a lot of fans here at the stadium making their way to the exits. Viscaino making his way to the dugout and the Yankees will call on Scott Proctor did the ritualistic burning of all of his clothes after the game yesterday work. We'll see when we get back. Well if you can catch it live catch it later on WB Mason presents Yankees Encore. It's a replay of every Yankees game that gives you a second chance to see all the excitement of Bombers baseball. WB Mason presents Yankees Encore later after each game and again the next morning at nine only on yes. Well, Luis Vizcaino had been pitching so well the last couple of weeks but he gives up two huge runs here in the eighth inning and now they turn it over to Scott Proctor. Proctor deals to Johnson and there's a strike. If you joined us late you see Proctor's numbers after the game yesterday about an hour after the game he took all of his belongings that aren't owned by the Yankees like the uniform and the hat and he set them on fire in front of the Yankee dugout glove spikes under shirts and right now it worked as he gets Johnson to fly out to center field. Melky Cabrera is there and that'll do it. But two big runs for the A's on three hits no errors and two men left. Yankee task got a little tougher as we go to the bottom of the eighth 11 5 open. Time for the Yankees in game box score sponsored by Hummer Yankees have 10 hits and five of them at the bottom of the order Andy Phillips three for three two ribbies and a run scored Cabrera two for three with a double. Posada with two hits Jeter with a hit in the ribby they've held Alex Rodriguez down and now Phillips will lead off and he hits the first pitch from Casilla into right field Jack Cust is there one away so they finally retire Andy Phillips and here's Melky Cabrera. You know this series against the A's is a big series and the series coming up against the Twins a big series and the reason for that the Yankees have to jump over five teams to get the wild card and two of those teams are the A's and the Twins and they're in danger of losing the series to the A's and that means losing a game to Oakland and then Minnesota comes in for four games and it's imperative that you shave some games off the teams in front of you. And then the uh, the first half of the season ends for the Yankees with three games against the Angels. This is not a uh, an easy stretch for the Yankees. And they play very well at home, but they have three teams that are in essence in front of them. The Angels are, are leading the West, so they're not technically a wild card team. But let's say they fell back. They'd be somebody that the Yankees would have to take it, overtake as well. Foul the way. It's almost like you have to take a step backwards and not really even concern yourself on the teams that you're playing. And I understand your point, Michael. You know, these are all clubs fighting for a wild card. But, you know, until the Yankees figure their, their team out and, and how to get out of this offensive slump, and, you know, they score five runs today, have 10 hits, and, you know, the pitching with Andy Pettit wasn't great today. And Melky Cabrera goes down swinging. But, you know, you almost, you almost, can't start looking at the road trip you thought was going to be a great trip would have lined up Colorado San Francisco and Baltimore and it didn't work out that way and then you look at this homestand and Oakland a ball club you think you should do something against and hasn't worked out for looks like two of the three games well in essence you, you are correct John where you can't worry about who you're playing you got to win games you've got to win series and right now the Yankees are, are in this virtual free fall where they won one game on the road trip another one pending and now they're in danger of losing two out of three to the A's and you could talk about wild cards coming back and catching the Red Sox in the East none of that works unless you win I mean it's all just theory unless you put W's up and there's really been only one stretch of games that the Yankees have really won at the rate that people expect them to win probably above the rate that people expect them to win. they won 11 of 12 games before the road trip you take that stretch out and the entire Yankee season has not been very good. 
And I think Joe Torrey says it perfectly. You know, these are games that you're not going to get back. You know, you're losing time here, and now you're in the month of July. And you're playing teams here with Oakland that you think you should, you know, really get fat against, and it just hasn't happened. But, you know, it all comes down to that starting pitching. If you can get the five guys in this rotation, get them rolling in the right direction, then you start thinking about winning streaks. But until that happens, you know, you're really just kind of fighting day to day. 3 1. There's a strike to Damon. Damon's one for four today, flied to right, doubled to right, struck out, and then reached on a 1 6 fielder's choice. Foul back. And Chin Ming Wong has been a bright spot, but not of late. He hasn't pitched as well as he uh, is expected to pitch. The last two times he's blown leads. And the Yankees can't afford to blow leads. They can't afford to give victories away. He gave away one in San Francisco, one in Baltimore. That one's popped up. Chavez near the seats leans in and makes the play knew exactly where he was and put it away for the final out of a one two three inning so the Yankees go down in order here in the eighth and we will take it to the ninth. eight innings in the books and Oakland leads the Yankees 11 five right here on yes Hey fans, keep it here on Yes following the last out for the Nissan Post game as Nancy Newman gives you detailed analysis of this matchup with the A's and Kim Jones ventures into the clubhouse for exclusive interviews with all the key players. It's the Nissan Post game immediately following the game right here on Yes. Bobby Crosby takes a pitch outside from Proctor the count 1 and 0. 11 5 A's. Rubber game of a three game set. Proctor deals. High fly ball center field. Cabrera is there and there's one away final out of the uh, bottom of the eighth inning and that young man was made very very happy might have become an Oakland A fan Chavez gets the uh, final out then has the presence of mind to just flip it to the kid and look at the look on his face thank you See, that's a polite child we'll be talking about that for a long time with Jason Kendall Now John we touched on the uh, the Proctor ritualistic burning. Is that just superstition is that how players are trying to burn away the bad spirits. Of course I mean that's his own uh, you know the way he wanted to get rid of the demons but you know the bottom line for Scott Proctor is he has to throw his off speed pitches for strikes. I mean he's got a good fastball but he can't challenge hitters and fastball counts because they know it's coming. So for him an inning like this is a good situation work on your curveball. Work on your changeup. He threw his changeup in the eighth inning to get the last out. But kind of take this opportunity to work on your off-speed pitches and, and get more consistent throwing them for strikes. It'll make your fastball that much better. But to answer your question, baseball players are extremely superstitious. If you're going well, you wear the same undershirt under your uniform, things like that. Popped up. Cano is there, and there's two away. You know Alex Rodriguez had that unbelievable series in San Francisco and before the Sunday game in the clubhouse I walked up to him and I said you know why do you uh, why do you have such good numbers in this ballpark because even when he was a Mariner he had unbelievable numbers and he looked at me and goes Mike no knock no disrespect I can't talk about it it'll be a jinx and he meant it mm -hmm. this is arguably the greatest player on earth and he was worried about talking about how he does well because he thinks it would jinx him. Yeah, you don't want to do anything differently. You know, you just kind of ride out the hot streaks and, you know, come to the ballpark the same time, do the same routine, and hope that you ride it out as long as you can. Kotze serves that one into left center. And Matsui is there. And a nice job by Proctor as he retires all four A's that he has faced. So the ritualistic burning seemed to have worked. Let's see if it works for the Yankees. Last licks coming up in the bottom of the ninth. They're down 11-5. Tomorrow night on Yes, the Minnesota Twins are in town and they will face Roger Clemens and the Yankees in the first of four in the Bronx. Complete coverage starts at six with batting practice today, followed by the Tri State Board pregame and then all the play by play. Yankees against the Twins tomorrow night at six and it's right here on Yes. 
So we will get a chance to see the A's closer. Well, the A's closer is really Houston Street, but he's hurt. And uh, they have given Alan Embry the job, and he's done a pretty good job for a guy who's never done this before in his life. He's pitched in 37 games already, more than a hit per inning, decent strikeout to walk ratio, and he has picked up eight saves. And he's a little different from most of the left-handed pitchers that you're going to see. He's got a good fastball, and the slider is not a big sweeping slider. It's more of a short, hard slider. Yeah, talking to Allen before the first game of the series, he said, you know, his one regret from his Yankee days is he was not healthy. Had about eight bone chips taken out of his left elbow, and now it's all cleaned up. He's throwing the ball a lot better, but that's his one regret. When he was with the Yankees, he felt like he was never 100% healthy, and the numbers reflected it. Now, his numbers were actually better prior to his last two outings. In his last two outings, he's given up seven runs in one and two-third innings, five hits, and four walks. And Bob Guerin said one of them was my fault because we had Rich Harden in the game and Harden all of a sudden just couldn't go anymore. And I told Embry that not to be ready until the inning after that. We had to rush him. He goes, and the last one was the only time that you can say, well, he didn't pitch well. And maybe that was an offshoot of the previous time when he came in before he was ready. He said, but he's been great. He said, we have no complaints about Alan Embry. So he will face Jeter in the count 1 and 0. Foul back. Jeter with a big base hit in the sixth inning. Kept the inning alive, cut it to 8 5, and also broke an 0 for 10 slide for him. Yankee fans might want to know Texas leading Boston 2 to 1 in the seventh inning at Fenway. So uh, the Rangers have helped the Yankees out because uh, they knocked off Boston yesterday. Right now the deficit remains at 11 and you don't want it to go any more than that. We told you about the deficit earlier in the wild card. See Embry's velocity back to 94 miles an hour with his Yankee days. You know that velocity was maybe 91 92. He's got that elbow cleaned up. He's 94 again, back to like the old days. There's a line drive. The left center field it is a base hit. Stewart Fields gets the ball in quickly, and Jeter starts the ninth inning with a single. So you have to do it if you want to start thinking about a great comeback. And he threw some good fastballs and then decides to go with that slider. And like I said before, it's not the big sweeper. It's not a big off-speed pitch. It's more of a hard slider. It's right in the middle of the plate, and Derek Jeter had his bat sped up right there, able to get a base hit. That'll bring up Cano, who has not had a good day in the number three hole in the lineup. And there's a strike. Baseball's weird like that if you if you drop somebody in the order or you move somebody in the order, big moments always seem to find them. Or if you try to sneak somebody into a, a spot in the field, he's not a good defender, the ball will find you. So they move Cano to the three hole and he's come up in big spots all day. Tries to pull an outside pitch, bad hitting there, and Johnson will step on the bag as Jeter moves to second. Now when Cano's right, that ball served in the left field, but he tried to pull it. That's exactly right. And, you know, when Joe Torre moves some of these hitters around in the lineup, you know, especially a, a younger player like Robinson Cano in a number three hole, you just don't want him to change his approach. Just kind of keep the same approach. Your strength is middle of the field the other way. It just looks like Robbie had a tough day. Cano is over 70 points lower than he was last year. Remember, he finished third in the batting race in the American League. And we've told you in the past about his struggles in day games. And uh, it's it's been a, a tough season here for Cano. Here's Alex Rodriguez. Rodriguez at 79 ribbies, and uh, Jeter represents number 80 there at second. 0 for 3 for A. Rod. You know, Michael getting back to Robinson Cano it really seems like the American League now they don't throw him too many strikes he's kind of got this reputation now as a free swinger and they, they figured him out a little bit. 
and there's a fine line there between taking away a young player's aggressiveness. You know, you don't want him to go up there all of a sudden looking for pitches and being more patient. You see the frustration on the face of Robinson Cano, but you know, you need to get a little better understanding of the strike zone and make some pitchers earn it instead of you know just throwing balls up there like Embry did and rolled over a slider. And part of the problem for Cano, and, and you talk to people in baseball, is that his physical skills are probably too good because he could put balls into play that others won't be able to reach or would swing and miss. And so it's at actually playing against him that he's such a good hitter. But he's got to be more patient. And not just put him into play, but put him into play hard. I mean, he reaches pitches that are off the plate and is able to rifle them the other way. But, you know, at some point to go to that next level, you really got to learn the strike zone and tighten it up a little bit, make the pitcher work a little bit harder. 2 1. Foul back in the count, 2 and 2. It all comes with experience. You know, the first time in here in Robinson Cano's young career that he's going through some tough times. And you, you find out a lot about a player when he does this. Can he make the adjustments? Is he going to fight his way through it? The 2 2. Right in on the fist of A. Roddy fouls it back to the screen. Mm -hmm. And he's also got to get past the inability to hit in day games. I mean, it really is frightening. The splits, how much better he is as a night game hitter. And his good buddy Cabrera is a complete opposite. Melky Cabrera is great in day games and bad in night games. And the count three and two. A-Rod not giving this at bat away. Alan Embry doesn't look like he wants to make the same mistake he made to Derek Jeter, and that is a mistake with the slider. He's going with all fastballs to Alex Rodriguez. That fastball up just a little bit out of the zone, and a veteran pitcher like Alan Embry knows how he has had success against Alex Rodriguez. Hard stuff up in the zone. Looks like he's trying to attack him that way. And this is now turned into what is going to be a nine pitch at bat. Embry deals the 3 2. And A Rod worked the walk. Shows you he's not giving away bats. Despite being down 11 5, he's not going to swing at anything to put it into play. He'll take the walk rather than get into bad habits. Now the focus is still there, and you know what? That's a nice battle right there between a veteran left hander and a, and a superstar player in Alex Rodriguez. All fastballs. You're going to get me or I'm going to get you. But like you said, Alex showed the discipline not to go out of the strike zone. Worked himself a walk. And here is Posada. And there's a strike. Now Posada caught Embry when he was here. Is a catcher at an advantage because he knows the pitcher? I think he's at an advantage a little bit but with a guy like Embry his game plan is so simple I mean he's, he's a power pitcher from the left side you know good fastball he throws an occasional slider but these guys have faced each other he's caught him he knows what his bread and butter is and that's a fastball and you see even when you know it I mean it's 95 miles an hour it's middle of the plate and Jorge was still late on that one great catch by a kid in the upper deck brought his glove and made a great stab.
And the 0-2. This could do it. There's one. And there's two. Ball game is over. And Oakland beats the Yankees 11-5. So Bob Guerin's team comes into New York and beats the Yankees two out of three. Painful day for the Yankees. They had one of their best going in Andy Pettit, and Andy simply did not have it on this day, giving up a run in the first and then seven in the second before being knocked out of the ball game. And after that, the Yankees played catch up all day and just couldn't make it happen. Home runs by uh, Jack Cust. Big, big blow in the game. Also in that second inning, a home run by Dan Johnson. So Yankees uh, lose on Friday. Or check that they win on Friday. They lose yesterday, 7 0. And now 11 5 today. Alone on their thoughts, the Yankees now have to straighten things out. The Twins coming to town. Awards post game coming up. Well, not much positive for the Yankees in this 11 5 loss, but we go all the way back to the first inning for the Geico play of the game. Call Geico and save 15% on your car insurance. Yeah, the Geico play of the game happened right away. Shannon Stewart leading off this ball game in the hole. Derek Jeter with the jump step and the strong throw over to Andy Phillips at first base. Derek Jeter with your Geico play of the game. And that about amounts to the positives for the Yankees 11 16 0. Beating 5, 11, and 1. Harron the win, 10 and 2. Not a great start for him, but he got the victory. Andy Pettit was roughed up, one and two thirds, and he drops the four and six. Time of the game, 320. Jack Cust from Flemington, New Jersey, three for five, a double a home run, four ribbies. Andy Phillips, a good day for the Yankees, three for four, two ribbies, and a run scored. So, who is our Chevy player of the game? Could be Jack Cust. When we come back, we'll find out. Then Nancy and Kim work the post game right here on Yes, 11 5, Oakland. It's time to announce the Chevy player of the game is voted on by you, the fans, and the two of us here in the booth. John? Your Chevy player of the game, Flemington, New Jersey's Jack Cust, the three-run homer off of Andy Pettit. That happened early on in this ball game. He had three hits, four RBIs. That fourth RBI came right here, the double off of Mike Myers the other way. And Jack Cust is your player of the game. So the Yankees lose two out of three to the Oakland A's Twins coming into town. Coming up on the Yes Network, stay tuned for the Nissan New York Yankees postgame show with Nancy Newman and Kimberly Jones featuring complete game analysis and interviews. The senior producer of the Yes Network in today's game produced by Kevin Smolin, directed by John Wilson, pre and post game produced by Bill Bolin, and directed by John Purcell. Supervising producer Woody Fryman and the executive producer of the Yes Network is Mr. John Filippelli. Please join us again tomorrow for Yankees baseball as the Bombers take on the Minnesota Twins right here at Yankee Stadium. The coverage begins at 6 p.m. with batting practice today, followed by the New York Yankees pregame in high definition where available. For more on the Yes Network, log on to yesnetwork.com. Once again, the final score of the Oakland Athletics 11 and the New York Yankees 5. We'll be back from the booth with some final thoughts in just a moment, but now let's go to Nancy Newman, who is waiting in our studio.